Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is the April 23rd hearings before the Baltimore Municipal Zoning Appeals Board. A um, few preliminary items before we get started. Please turn off all cell phones or at least turn them to vibrate. Um, not only are they disrupted to the proceedings, they interfere with the recordation of the proceedings here today. Um, we have, I don't think we have any postponements today. Um, we're going to call the cases generally as they appear on the docket. Uh, when we call your case, uh, the appellant should stand to my left. Anyone in opposition should stand to my right. The appellant will state his or her case. The opposition then will put their opposition on the record, and the appellant will have the opportunity to close, and that will end the proceeding. We don't go back and forth and back and forth with that. We will vote on the appeals at the end of today. Uh, and anyone who wishes to stay and listen to a civics lesson certainly has the opportunity to do so. Otherwise, you can call tomorrow morning and get our decision. And the number to call is 410-396-4301. And I'll give that to you again. 410-396-4301. Please do not build on Baltimore City without the appropriate building permits. Um, we have a number of people here today who are in opposition to cases, and we have found that sometimes discussion between the parties uh, can lead to an agreement between the parties. Uh, the zoning board will make a decision independent of what the parties may or may not agree to, but we do find it helpful for people to talk. So what I'm going to do to start off is just call the cases for which opposition is signed in and just stand up and we'll find out if there's any um, any sense in the people talking. First case is 1235 Union Avenue. Councilman, I know you are in opposition. Who is here for the, Mr. Prattle, is he here? No, this is Union Avenue. No. This is Union Avenue. Oh, sorry. Oh, are you here? Yeah, 1235 Union Avenue. Oh, no, that's so, sorry. Are they in the hallway? Miss Maloney? <coughs> Maloney? He might be out in the uh, All right, so we'll, we'll pass on that one. Now I think we have the right case. Um, west side of Elm Avenue, Cheryl Wilson. That's us. That's you. Okay. Where's uh, Ms. Wilson? Here. Okay. Have you all had the chance to talk? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. Do you think any more talk would solve anything? Well, then that answers that. Thank you. We'll call your case in turn. 2019-102, uh, 1624 El Reno Street. In opposition. You're in opposition. Who's the appellant? You're the appellant. Have you guys had a chance to talk? No, I don't want to talk to them. I'm tired of talking. I went to council members and... Okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. We, we hear you loud and clear. <laughs> All right, so... Next, we're going to call the cases for which we believe we have sufficient information to approve the appeal. These are called our consent cases. I'm going to call a number of cases up in a row. Please line up here, starting right here at my left, and then line up down the, uh, down the end here. So the first consent case is 2019-86, 835 South Decker Street. Next is... 2019-89-1726 West Franklin Street. Next, 2019-91-2216 Bank Street. 20-19-92-230 North Linwood Avenue. 2019-93-824 Mangold Street. 2019-98-916 North Broadway. 2019-103-3437 Hickory Avenue. 2019-104-1008 Morton Street. And last, 2019-105-5835 Park Heights Avenue. Okay. The 
gonna get everybody up here, then we'll get everybody sworn in. Everybody raise your right hands, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Great. First case, 2019-86, uh, 835 South Decker Street. Good afternoon. State your name for the record, please. Matthew Mel. And, sir, we have this to construct second floor rear addition and rooftop deck. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Any staff reports? Uh, one letter of support for this case in the file uh, from the uh, Canton Community Association. Great. Thank you. Um, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, sir. No. Sony Board, having reviewed your case, has found we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Next, 2019 89, 1726 West Franklin Street. Good morning. Good morning. Just afternoon, actually. Oh, good afternoon. Would you state your name for the record? Jonathan Carroll. Mr. Carroll, we have this to construct new single family detached dwelling. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Great. Any staff reports? Yes, thank you. Martin French for the Baltimore City Department of Planning. Planning Department has reviewed this application and recommends approval subject to the condition that the proposed new dwelling structure is completed in accordance with plans and designs approved by the Department of Planning. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And Mr. Carroll, are those conditions acceptable to you? Yes, sir. Great. Zoning Board, do you have any questions? No, sir. Zoning Board, having reviewed your appeal, we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Next, 2019-91, 2216 Bank Street. Good afternoon. Good Brandon afternoon. Bonioto is my name. Hey, and Mr. Bonioto, uh, we have this to construct second floor rear addition of rooftop deck. Is that correct? Correct. Great. Do we have any staff reports? Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Great. Do you have any questions? No, sir. Uh, zoning Board, having reviewed your appeal, we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, 2019-92, 230 North Linwood Avenue. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. State Chair. State your name, please. Dave Garza for Baltimore Development. Ramona del Carmen Reyes. Great. And we have this to use first floor as beauty salon and spa. Is that correct? Correct. And we have staff reports? Yes. Planning Department has reviewed this application and recommends approval. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? No. no. Zoning Board, having reviewed your appeal, we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, 2019-93, 824 Mangold Street. Okay. Uh, after that, 2019-98, 916 North Broadway Street. Good afternoon. All right. Just state your name for the record, please. Edin Sandewater. And Mr. Sandoval, we have this to use first floor as variety store. Is that correct? Correct. Great. Do we have any staff reports? Thank you, yes. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is in the Gay Street 1 Urban Renewal Plan area. Therefore, exterior alterations may be subject to review by the Planning Department. The Department recommends approval of the application be subject to the condition that all exterior modifications, additions, or other changes to the existing structure are completed in accordance with plans approved by the Planning Department. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Sandoval, are those conditions acceptable to you? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions? No. Uh, the Zoning Board, having reviewed your appeal, we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you very much. Thank you. 2019-103, uh, 3437 Hickory Avenue. Good afternoon. State your name, please. Michael Morris. And Mr. Morris, we have this to construct second story, two story rear addition. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Staff reports? Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Morris, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I don't. The Zoning Board, having reviewed your appeal, we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you. 2019 104, 1008 Morton Street. Okay, next on the docket, 2019-105, 5835 Park Heights Avenue. State your name, please. Bob Rosenfeld. And Mr. Rosenfeld, we have this to construct one-story corner side addition, and I think this, your application has been amended, is that correct? Uh, 
Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Do we have any staff reports? Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. We also have one letter of support on behalf of the Glen Neighborhood Improvement Association. Great. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? No. Does the only board having reviewed your appeal? We have sufficient information to approve your Thank appeal. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So next we're going to move into our regular docket. Uh, we're going to start off with 2018-420. Uh, I'm going to call two cases at once. 2018-420, 230 North Cary Street, and 2018-421, 232 North Cary Street. Thank you. Let's get everyone in who's going to provide testimony. I raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Great. Council, you state your names for the record, please. Good afternoon. For the record, Justin Williams from the law firm Rosemary Martin Greenberg, here with my colleague Caroline Hecker, joined by uh, Noble Byer and Evan Roberts from the applicant and from the community uh, Franklin Square Community Association, Edith Gillard Canty, and Dominic McKaylee from uh, Council Bullock's office. Great. Thank you very much. So you're here, this case is here, both of these two cases are here on a reconsideration. So I'd like to hear why this board should reconsider first. Sure. Um, so, um, members of the board, uh, I've included in the packets um, a lot of information for you, but we copied the letter that we submitted um, uh, requesting the board reconsideration, reconsider its decision from January 15th to deny the initial request for variances for both properties, which located side by side in the Franklin Square neighborhood at 230 and 232 North Cary Street. Um, we think the grounds for the reconsideration are that uh, due to inadvertence or the lack of information and evidence that, that the board had, they would have changed their decision. We've discussed with the Department of Planning the evidence that we'll, I'll go through, and they've at least changed their mind or dropped their objection, so we believe that the board would be willing to change their decision in this matter as well. I can go through it, but generally the two pieces of information are community support, which we have letters, letters in the files from the Franklin Square Community Association and the Southwest Partnership, <coughs> um, and Councilman Bullock's office is here to support as well in person. And then secondly, probably most importantly, the, I have evidence to, to demonstrate that the feasibility of repurposing the building for the three and four units that are allowed by right on the property is not feasible. Um, there's cross sections in the file that show that the levels of the houses um, from front to rear uh, vary in height. And there's pictures in the last page showing a sample <coughs> showing how if it were to be just three units, no, the normal way would be to have one unit on the third floor, one unit on the second floor, one unit on the first floor. However, because of the configuration of the home, that happened way before the applicant acquired an interest in the property. And Ms. Uh, Gillard Canty would testify that her mother actually lived in the, one of the properties in the, in the 1940s and would say that even at that time it was six units. And that to repurpose the, the units for the three units by right or four units by right would not be practical. Okay. Mr. French, uh, we're still hearing this on uh, reconsideration. Um, what's the planning department's position on this at this point? Well, <clears throat> as Mr. Williams is suggesting, the department is not opposed to an approval of six dwelling units uh, because of the fact that these particular buildings uh, or this building in case of 230 North Cary, but likewise for 232 North Cary, they apparently were built as a pair and pretty much designed architecturally identically. Um, the portion of the building which would in the olden days be called the front building is uh, taller than the portion of the building that in the old days would be called the back building. And because of that, there are floor level differences uh, between the front and the back that basically were taken advantage of uh, by the person who divided the uh, upper floors, the three dwelling, th three levels, pardon me, first floor level, second floor level, and third floor level into a front and a back apartment because they are at different heights, floor heights. And so the department recognizes that there are, in that sense, um, 
some unusual conditions within these buildings uh, that are not normally encountered in Baltimore uh, housing, where usually the front and back building have the same height and uh, therefore the same floor levels. So the department uh, was opposed to the concept of eight dwelling units, and that was the point of the department's memo. The department saw no reason to authorize basement apartments in this situation but was certainly comfortable with six dwelling units in the building. Okay. Um, I'm inclined to grant the motion for reconsideration. Is there any objection on the board? Okay. So that's great. Let's hear, let's hear about the, the project. All right. So to go into the merits discussion, I've included um, the, in the file a number of uh, examples, and I'll walk through briefly, and if the board has any questions, we're, um, we're here, happy to answer them. Um, the board already heard most information in the initial January 15th hearing. Um, but I put it in the file an aerial photo showing the property at 230 and 232 uh, North Cary Street. It's a block north of Franklin Square Park, a block south of the highway to nowhere, Route 40, and with one walking distance of the West Baltimore Mark train station. <coughs> uh, I put also a zoning map for you to show that the property, one of which one of those properties is zoned R1 and one is zoned R8, um, which is relevant that um, if the OR1 zone property has more density than the R8 property, and if they were combined, the lot area variance would be smaller than, um, I guess, initially considered, and that would be less of a magnitude of a variance to be granted. <coughs> um, the property is located in the Franklin Square Historic District. I'll include a copy of that in the file for you as well. Um, talking about the history of the Franklin Square neighborhood and how it, the neighborhood has suffered from lack of investment in, in white flight from the 60s through today. Um, which is part of the reason why the Community Association has been in full support of this development, that they recognize that but for the ability to do six units in each of these properties, the properties would not would be vacant forever and continue the kind of lack of investment and blight in the community. Uh, I've included aerial photos showing the back, and like Mr. French alluded to, there was a rear L in these properties because these used to be, as mentioned in the historic form, the sort of higher class mansion type units in the neighborhood from the 1800s where the rear portion of the property was used by servants and so that's why it was a little different difference in height which is the real uniqueness factor for why we need the lot area variance today and we think we're entitled to it yeah. i'm included also in the exhibits census data showing the census tract information um, there's a persistence of poverty in this neighborhood in the census tract and the median rental income median rent charged by units in this area is only 771 dollars um, per month, and so if the applicant were forced to do only three or four units by, that they could do by right, <coughs> they would have to charge rates that are just too high to get a return um, in this community. Uh. <coughs> Um, finally, I guess I, I, before I get through the factors that the board should consider, I have the letters of support, which I think we've already referenced for you. Um, I can go through the factors of why the board should grant the variance. Put them on the property. record, yeah. Okay. So they're, inclu they're included in the outline, which is in the exhibits. It uh, starts on page <coughs> seven. I guess in the first matter, the, um, on page six, the variance is required are a lot area variances for density and a parking variance. Um, actually, not included in our, the filing is that properties will probably have two parking spaces behind each unit, but just to be consistent, we'll request a variance for no parking spaces, and the um, community association president would testify there's not a parking issue in the area. <coughs> um, for the standards the board should consider, um, there's a, the test for variances is that the property is unique and that's the practical difficulty caused. So here the uniqueness is caused by the virtue of the building being in the National Historic District, and they want to try to, the applicant wants to comply with the National Historic uh, Preservation Standards and apply for CHAP tax credits, and they need to maintain the interiors of the buildings as best they can. <coughs> and that, along with the neighborhood's uh, household income being lower than the city's average, may make it unique that the property needs to have these um, six units in them to make them viable. Um, and that's a practical difficulty that the applicant would face. If they had to do three or four units, they could not do so um, efficiently, economically. Um, addition, for the board, the factors the board must consider are in per 5-308B. Um, the properties, um, the issues face are unique 
As I mentioned, these, property, these conditions faced are unique to the R8 and OR1 zone as it applies to our property and not citywide, as Mr. French mentioned. These are unique properties that we provided with uh, different floor levels. <coughs> Um, the unnecessary hardship and practical difficulty is not caused by the applicant. This uh, happened and predated their uh, interest in the property. <clears throat> the purpose of the variances is not based exclusively on a desire to increase the value or income potential in the property. The variance is requested only to make this rehabilitation viable and economically possible. If it weren't, then the applicant would walk away, and the community association letter mentions that as well, that they would rather see development happen here as opposed to a vacant building. That <clears throat> contributes to blight in the neighborhood. Um, the variance did not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of other property in the immediate vicinity or substantially diminish and repair property values in the neighborhood. Um, again, the community association support and the councilman support are um, good indicators that the community feels that this is a good applicant and will do good work and that it's necessary for the community. The variance is also in harmony with the purpose and intent of the zoning code. It it's um, in line with the goals of the city's comprehensive master plan, which is to promote housing opportunity and op options for the neighborhood. Um, it's also near the West Baltimore Mark train station, which promotes transit-oriented development, and people can walk to the Mark train or the bus depot there. <coughs> uh, the variance is not precluded by any urban renewal plan, um, and it's in line with the CHAP district. Um, the, uh, the applicants seeking CHAP cre tax credits and they'll help maintain a building that's really a beautiful building, but in the CHAP district. But for these variances, they would have to walk away. Um, as I mentioned before, um, it has the support of the public and therefore will not be detrimental to the public health, safety, general welfare, or morals. Um, it's only addition of two or three units more than what would be allowed by right, and it won't cause any exterior changes to the property. Um, and so for those reasons, we request the board to grant the variances. Okay. And I, I do you want to speak, Ms. Killer? I was going to say, do you have any testimony? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Is there any further staff reports? We start off by talking about the reconsideration, but I didn't think there were. Okay. Any questions from the board? Nope. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just for the record, that was uh, both um, case 2018-420 and 2018-421, which covered 230 North Cary Street and the other North Cary Street address, 232 North Cary Street. Is that correct? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next case, 2018-425, uh, 3804 West Rogers Avenue. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <coughs> I'll get you sworn in in a second. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Would you state your name for the record, please? My name is Matthew Akinyemi. And Mr. Akinyemi, we have this to use as three dwelling units. Is that correct? That's correct. Great. And do we have any staff reports? Yes, one moment, please. The Planning Department has reviewed this application. This property is located in the Park Heights Urban Renewal Area, which would not prohibit this proposed use as a continuing non-conforming use. The department notes, therefore, because it is a non-conforming use proposed, the department recommends disapproval of the application unless the applicant provides the board information showing that non-conforming use of this property as a multifamily dwelling has not been discontinued or abandoned. Thank you. All right, sir, would you, why don't you tell us a little bit about your project, but I'd also like you to focus on the, the points raised by Mr. French. Okay, yeah, the project, the house is actually completed already. So this is actually a postponement. I've been here uh, like one time or there are two times or there about. So um, I think we're just trying to establish that uh, it was not vacant for 12 months consecutively. And like I said, I contacted BGE but they could not give me like a paper tray uh, information to support that. And I think uh, I spoke with Mr. Derek several times also. So uh, they could not find the information of when it was, you know, last uh, 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 rented or so. But as it is right now, the property has been completed and fine. I have people there renting the property. I actually have my contractor right, have a write up to explain 
uh, to the board that uh, uh, you know it's going to be very difficult to make it like a single unit or so that it's actually constructed at a multi unit with three meters and three floor separate uh, apartment originally so how's it constructed as, uh, explain me how's it it's constructed as a three unit building yeah you know it was originally registered as three units you would separate uh, entrance to the uh, each apartment floor okay Mr. Chairman, just to clarify, um, this property is located in an R4 zoning district mm -hmm. where multiple family dwellings would not be allowed by right. Um, the issue before the board in this case uh, before as today is whether or not there was any lawfully established multifamily use on the property and whether or not that multifamily, st uh, multifamily status was discontinued or abandoned at any point in the last 12 months. There's a history of this property at least since 1961 as being established as three dwelling units at that time. Uh, but again, given the zoning district not allowing multifamily, if that property has been discontinued for 12 consecutive months, uh, it would lose that status as multifamily. So it would be incumbent upon the applicant to provide any and all evidence um, to this board to establish uh, that, th that the property has not been discontinued as a multifamily property. As the applicant mentioned, things, records from BGE or other uh, utilities, uh, prior leases, um, a current lease, testimony from neighbors, uh, all those things would be relevant um, before the board to establish that that multifamily use has not been abandoned, um, but that would be for the applicant to provide to the board. So what is in the building today in it's terms of dwelling units? How many people are living there? Three. You have three people. How, or is one in each unit? Yes. So all three units are occupied? Mm -hmm. No, okay. one is not occupied. The middle one is not occupied. Okay. And for any of these units? Yes, I have the list right. And how long, how long have you owned the property? Um, since uh, 2017, December. Like the last time I came here, I actually came here with the agent, listen agent, when, when we spoke. So, you know, but I, I bought it in December 22, 2017. And has the building been occupied? In all, you say you have a vacant unit now. When you bought the building, was it occupied as three units? It was not occupied when I bought it. You it was know. vacant? Yeah, it was vacant when I bought okay. it. Okay. Um, so you rented it up? Correct. Okay. Okay. So I fixed it up, rented it out. So, you know, that was how I brought the uh, listing agent last week. And I mean, last time he was able to explain some stuff to okay. let you know what's going on. It would, um, any, well, let me ask, does, any questions from the board? <coughs> Any evidence um, would be very helpful. Um, any written evidence would be very helpful, but um, you know, you're here today after postponing it, so I'm assuming that you, you're unable to get any additional evidence. No, my contract, I'm actually checking my email because I've sent him all the information and I informed him because I spoke with Mr. Derek. He said if I can get something from him. So, but he was not around, so he just called me outside. He's going to send in a couple of minutes. So I'm still waiting for him to send some information uh, about, you know, how the property is constructed just to support. Then I also have, although sh she's not here to actually, uh, for the airing, she was here to meet me. I have someone from the community here just to talk to, to meet me, you know, to know who I am and all this kind of stuff. So I don't think the community is a guest to it uh, right now. So all right, well, let's do this. Let's give your contractor uh, some time. We've, okay. got, we've got a lot of people here sure. today, so if you, it, we'll just put your case on hold. Okay. Uh, we'll recall it. Uh, okay, good. And if he gets back to you by the end of the day, then end of our session here, then we'll bring you back up. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next case. 2019-40, 3226 Bel Air Road. Morning, afternoon. I do. Good. And would you state your name for the record, please? My name is David Hathaway. And Mr. Halfway, we have this to use portion of first floor as educational facility. Is that correct? That is correct. And do we have staff reports? 
I have a couple of letters, so bear with me. The first is from the Harbell Community Organization, uh, written to uh, Mr. Baumgartner. As the Community Service Director of the Harbell Community Organization, uh, I'm writing, to, writing you concerning uh, this appeal before you. Uh, it's used the first floor as 3226 Bella Road as an educational facility. Enclosed, you will find a code violation notice an order issued by Inspector Brandy Harrison on December 19, 2018, uh, that indicates this property was cited on that date for failure to obtain a use and occupancy permit to operate a phlebotomist training program within the first floor of that address. This property is within the boundaries of the Bel Air Edison Main Street, which is overseen by Bel Air Edison neighborhoods. Benny's vision is to build a Main Street that improves the surrounding Bel Air Edison Community Association and appeals to more than 30,000. Uh, cars that traverse this commercial corridor. Their goal was to attract businesses that perform proper market research, have strong business plans, and are willing to see a vision of a more prosperous Main Street. They have consistent issues with businesses that view this corridor as an inexpensive place to operate establishments for their own specialized uh, use directed at a personalized or specialized client. Further, Benning has attempted to meet with the operator of the phlebotomist training program to no avail. For all the cited reasons, Benny opposes this use. I think that. Signed I by think Michael Hilliard, the director of community services for Harbell Community Organization. And then one additional letter authored by the interim executive director for Bel Air, and Edison, Bel Air Edison Neighborhoods, Inc. Um, Benny opposes this appeal for 3226 Bel Air Road for the following reasons. Um, and Benny's vision, which basically is uh, the same uh, language that was used in Mr. Uh, Hilliard's letter before. So after he goes on to say, after speaking with Mr. Hathaway and receiving the business owner's contact information, Benny reached out to this particular business owner and scheduled a time to meet to further discuss this vision. The business owner never showed. It is concerning that this business has been functioning for some time without the proper zoning and possibly without the proper certifications. Um, submitted by Mel Freeman, Interim Executive Director, Bel Air Edison's Neighborhood Inc. Thank you. Planning Department reviewed this application, <clears throat> noted that this being a commercial district, C1, educational facilities which are deemed commercial vocational are not listed as a permitted or conditional use. The last use of the property was for offices, which was a permitted use. And the applicant would need to demonstrate that the proposed instructional facility would be more appropriately characterized as an educational facility post-secondary in order for the board to be able to consider this an application for a conditional use. The department planning recommends approval of the application if the board determines that the proposed use is a type of educational facility post-secondary, which is a conditional use in the C1 zoning district. Should the applicant not provide the board information supportive of this determination, the department recommends disapproval of the application because educational facilities, commercial, vocational, are prohibited uses in the C1 zoning district where this property is located. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Hathaway, tell us about your project. Uh, thank you guys for letting me present today. Um, I first want to just address the first letter that came out. I think that was from, I think that was written prior to me coming here last time and not. Um, uh, so you guys asked me to postpone the hearing to reach out to Mr. Mel Freeman, who's the executive director over at Benny. Um, we, we didn't ask you to postpone. Oh, yeah, gotcha. We <laughs> made a decision Correct. to postpone. I, I made a Mr. Okay. Chair, for the record, it is that letter is dated February 22nd, 2019. Uh, All right. I sh should have printed out a few more of these, but I just, just in case, I wanted to make sure. So I reached out to uh, Executive Director Mel Freeman uh, a couple times. We spoke. Um, and he was in full support of, of the building. I want to share my email, and I, I apologize for it not being, uh, it's a screenshot because I didn't actually know how to, how to save, so you, um, but it is actually dated from yesterday, and it's, it's just going over because I reached out to, he's a very hard gentleman to get a hold of, so I reached out to him a few times. Um, we had an ongoing conversation because as of our last meeting, that was the first time I had heard of that letter. Um, and uh, so I continued reaching out to him and then we finally got to speak and we got to speak for a while and uh, so as of yesterday I just want to make sure that he was in support so 
wanted to get written documentation from him. And in there, it says executive director. It's from Mel Freeman, but it says that he's in support of both of our projects on 3200 block. One is a coffee shop um, for our nonprofit, and the other one is for the phlebotomy training. Yeah. Um, so I just. You want us to make that part of the record here? Please. If you could actually. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys could reach out to the executive director of Mel Freeman, but I'm sure he would strike that from the record and take that as the evidence instead of his previous letter from when he had not spoke to me. Um, so we've spoken a few times since since the last time, but that, that was prior to the meeting where I didn't even know that <coughs> that he was in not in support. So um, I just ask you to kind of strike that one from the record and, and take that into evidence as he's saying, hey, we're in support of you. Well, given the fact that he's not here, we'll accept that in the rec into evidence, but we'll also maintain what we have. Gotcha. Just one question on that. Sure. The, the letter says, hey, David, thanks for reaching out. We are fully supportive of Holly. <coughs> so, ho so, so if you look at the like previous email where I'm talking about 3,200, so ho he, again, he is a very hard gentleman to, to get a hold of. So Holly is, is the operator for the coffee shop. And I just want to, she had reached out to him a couple times, and I just want to make sure that they were in connection so there wasn't a, a disconnect for either of the businesses for the coffee shop or the phlebotomy training. Um, to say, hey, are you in? Are you in support? Um, but you can. What, what coffee shop? It's 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 separate. Um, it's just me communi Again, sorry, this is me communicating with him for uh, a different building. Sorry, it's a different building, but me communicating with. Uh, so it says, hey, David, thanks for reaching out. We are fully supportive of Holly and won't fight the other. The other year, the phlebotomy. Correct. If you look in the here, you, would you like me to read it to the board? Just to, like I'll go down the email thread. I know it's kind, of, it's kind of confusing. I apologize. Um, so the last ones, you know, Happy Easter. I want to reach out to you and let you know we have a zoning hearing on Tuesday, 4-23-19 um, at 1 p.m. if you'd like to join. Um, I was hoping to have you, uh, the support of Benny on both a phlebotomy higher education training facility and Cups Coffee House on the 3200 block of Bel Air Road, me referring to both of the businesses let me know if you if you wanted to chat any more about the facilities and, and i will make myself available um so then his response was hey david thanks for reaching out we are fully supportive of holly and won't fight the other thank you for your continued support and vision um there was a there i could have printed out there was a a, a lot of unresponded to emails of me reaching out but we we actually spoke over the phone um a couple times but again he is it's, I'm sure he's busy, um, and he's he's a hard, hard hard gentleman. So I just was persistent to keep reaching out to make sure that that uh, either he would be here today or I'd have written proof of his support. So it wasn't just me telling you guys he supports us. Okay, okay. but I'll, I'll pass that around. You can add that to the record was too. There any change in the Harbell position? In the um, so this is the the recent letter that I have from the uh, Department of Planning. I asked about Harbell. We have not received any update from Harbell other than that prior letter, which was read. That's the letter the of record. record. I'm sorry? That's the letter of record? That's correct. Um, so I also want to pass this out to you guys. That I, and I apologize. This is the same thing that I passed out last time. It's from the Maryland Higher Education Commission. Um, and uh, again, the, the the building's in a C1 district. It's on the first level, um, and it, the C1 district does does pro, uh, does allow for uh, education facilities post secondary. Um, uh, from the zoning board, the definition of post secondary is an institution for higher learning, uh, and some examples are colleges and degree with uh, colleges and degrees. Um, so, and the doc from from the MHEC, the Maryland Higher Education Commission, letter grants the exemption from uh, the state's minimum education requirement because the, the uh, coursework is, is three weeks for phlebotomy training. She has to submit uh, coursework that goes over all of her education that she's providing. Um, the similarities of higher education post-secondary and why it should be called a higher education post-secondary, the phlebotomy training facility, um, is that there's a minimum education requirement. And as on the letter, you can see that um, the phlebotomy training can only be given to people that have allied, have prior allied health care training. Um, it's people that want more education. Um, 
this is not a requirement for hospitals or nurses aides or assisted living facilities. This is for people that want to increase their education with phlebotomy. Um, and for those of you that don't know, phlebotomy is intravenous. It's basically uh, taking blood and uh, giving, giving medicine. Um, and then the, uh, another similarity is that there's a degree or certificate that enhances your education and normally improves your career. Um, you, you receive a certificate from the state, um, which is enhancing your, shows that you've enhanced your, your, uh, your learning, which hopefully leads to higher salaries. <laughs> Um, in addition to, to being uh, a higher education post-secondary, um, this also benefits the community and the business district because it improves salaries, it provides uh, the community members um, another area to go get education, which there is few if, if I, I want to say there's none in, in the whole Bel Air Edison business uh, district, which is, consists of 95 businesses. Um, it, it provides people to uh, continue to increase their, their education after uh, high school or after college. Um, uh, the tenant also provides job placement services if needed. A, a lot of the students are already working at an assisted facility um, or, or their nurses or their doctors that just want to increase their, their learning. Um, but if they do want, she does provide a job placement service. Um, and as with Baltimore, as, as an increasing age demographic, it supports and improves um, services in the healthcare sector and hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, which Baltimore has a lot. Um, having the support of, of Benny um, with the executive director, Mel Freeman, um, and the planning, the, the planning board's letter just saying if it is a educational facility uh, post-secondary, higher education facility post-secondary that it should be approved. Um, I do think you guys should uh, consider it for uh, zoning as a higher education post-secondary facility. Is there some reason why, because you're not the one who's actually providing the training, right? Because you own the building and it's your tenant that provides the, the that, training. Right? That is correct. So is there some reason why your tenant is not here? Uh, the citation was given to me. And she was, but she was aware of the hearing today? She didn't want to come and say what, what exactly she would be doing for her phlebotomy training? Uh, I am here representing the building. Cause I, I cherish her as a, uh, uh, a, a good tenant. I think it's good for the business district. Um, like speaking to, to Mel, um, I have a vision for the 3200 block. Um, adding the first coffee shop, um, which is Cups Coffee House, uh, which we're going through zoning, going for permitting right now um, with the health department. Um, so I, I only think it adds to the to the block. So I'm I'm doing all the legwork. Yes. And is she providing training now? She's not providing training right now. We did receive a citation. She is a newer business. Uh, owner, um, she was unaware of requirements to uh, be licensed because she had the MHEC uh, uh, permission through the state. Uh, she thought that was sufficient. Um, she got cited, or I got cited. Um, I said, "Hey, you need to you need to fill out zoning." So uh, she immediately went over to zoning, and then zoning directed her over here. Um, so she she did that legwork, but but I'm here to prove the case that, that it is beneficial because I don't want to lose her as a tenant. It's, it's very hard over in that business district. Um, as, one, as one of those letter, letters stated, it's a, it's a very transient business district in Bel Air Edison. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a facade of barber shops and salons. And the last thing I want is you know, a third barber shop on the block. I don't think that, that helps at all. Um, I think being a phlebotomy training facility over there that that can provide jobs to the community. I think it, it is grossly beneficial to, to the community, to the uh, Bel Air Edison District. And again, the, the speaking of Mel, he does agree that that, that will, will provide the community with service and is a good business for the, the uh, Benny District. 
Any other questions from the board? No. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Next case is 2019-61, 12:35 Union Avenue. Everyone who's going to provide testimony sworn in. Raise your hands. You swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Yes. State your name for the record, please. Nate Prettle. Okay. Mr. Prettle. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Patricia Mahoney. Okay. Amani Sergis Martorella. Okay. Let me get that last name. Spell it. Sergis S U R G E S. First name. Nope. Last name. Give me your first name first. Amani A M A N I. Last name is S U R G E S space M A R T O R E L L A. M A R T O R E L L A. Okay. Mr. Prado, we have this to construct two story rear addition. Is that correct? That is correct. And do we have staff reports? We have a letter from the Hanman uh, Community Council in support of the appeal. We also have letters from. Residents on the 1200 block of 37th Street, uh, one, two, three, four letters um, in support of the appeal. Planning Department has no comment on this application. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. Prettle, tell us about the project. Good afternoon. Uh, Nate Prettle from AB Associates. I'm here with Amani Sergis, who's the property owner as well as the resident at 1235 uh, Union Avenue. I'm here to um, present for a proposal for a first floor rear addition as well as a second story rear addition. These are minimal additions. The first floor is roughly nine and a quarter feet by uh, six feet and the second floor addition is 12 by 14 feet. That's 12 feet deep into the rear yard by the width of the lot. Uh, the total addition of square footage is roughly 255 square feet. It's about 55 square feet on the uh, first floor, 200 feet, or sorry, about 180 square feet on the second floor. And the reason for these additions is to allow Ms. Sergis and her husband and well, their two kids to improve their property to remain in Hamden. They've been members of uh, the Hamden community for approximately 13 years. They love the neighborhood and they want to be able to raise their family and stay here. Uh, we're here to ask for minimal variances regarding the lot coverage and the uh, rear yard setback provisions. We have a unique property which is located on a very steep slope on the 1200 block of Union Avenue, which is on the west side of Falls Road. I should mention there are ways that this property could be improved in this manner that don't uh, require relief from the zoning code. However, I think by all accounts, they would be more adverse to adjacent property owners than the proposal forward. There's a front yard that could be developed. However, there are no additions in the front yard. There's a rather standard face of all of the houses on Union Avenue on the 1200 and 1100 blocks. They could build a third story rear addition uh, but again, this is a block of two stories. So after consulting with their architect, they felt the uh, most appropriate measure to improve their property to stay here would be to call for these uh, rear additions. I should mention they are minimal. They are based on the uniqueness of the property as well as the historic characteristics of the block. The first floor addition it would mirror where there's an existing overhang, a six foot overhang would be essentially framed in and it would provide a mudroom and a breakfast room off of their existing kitchen and the second floor would allow for a children's bedroom to 12 feet. These additions are in character with other additions that have been approved on the block. I can provide some examples at 1223, 1225, 1239, all have additions that go further back. Whether they came to the board or not, I think they may have been far uh, uh, it's, it's someday, I doubt any of these board members were here, but they may have come at, at, at some point. And I should mention that we've done an extensive community outreach for this. We met with the Hamden Zoning Land Use Committee where we gained their approval. We have, I believe, eight letters of support that should be in your file, I think six from the 1200 block of West 37th Street, which backs up to 1235 Union Avenue, as well as two others on the 1200 block of Union, including their adjacent neighbor at 1237 Union Avenue. We also have, as Mr. Baumgartner mentioned, a letter of support from the Hamden Community Council as well. And so I think that's, um, I'll let Imani talk a little bit about some of the reasons for this addition, but I'll leave it at that and maybe respond to the opposition afterwards. 
Thank you. Um, so my husband and I have been living in Hamden for 13 years in the same property. Um, we totally locked into the best block in Baltimore. Um, we really love our neighbors. We love where we are, um, and we're trying to make the uh, house something we can stay in for the long haul. Um, we have two young daughters who are not getting any smaller, um, and we're trying to make the uh, make it a property that we can stay in because we don't want to go. Okay. Let me hear from your opposition, please. Thank you. Um, I live mm -hmm. next door to Amani and her husband, Joe. Um, I've been there for 20... 20, 21 years. Um, I've lived in Hamden, Remington all of my life. Um, from what I understand, the additions that Amani and Joe want to make to their house, there's no place else in the in the neighborhood that has wants to go out that far. Um, on the opposite side of me is um, a family who had a dispute with the neighbors two doors up. They built a huge wooden fence along the fence between the, the second house because of um, issues with the children and dogs and pets and things and that was supposed to come down when the other family moved out they've been gone for a number of years that fence is still up um, there's a lot of trees and weeds not weeds but bushes or whatever they call them that grow along that fence that grows high you can't see up that end of the alley um, with the addition that Monty and Joe want to make to their house on this side is going to block any view that I have going down that way. So basically, I'm going to be living in a box, um, looking straight toward the back of my house. Um, also, the resale value of my home, I think, would be depleted by not having a view either way. Um, I do plan on trying to move in about three to four years, maybe five years, to nearer to my sister, an older sister down in Virginia. Um, but I don't know how that's going to plan out. That's in years to come. In the back of my house, the back wall, um, I have a, excuse me, I'm sorry, I have a letter. This explains some of my financial problems. And if anything were to happen to my home um, from this addition, I just would not be able to afford to um, make any repairs or um, upkeep, not upkeep, but Can any problems. Just make this part of the record. Yes, please. Um, I've had many medical issues. Uh, my finances are finance finances, excuse me, are depleted because of those issues. So anything that would happen to my house would be something that I'm not prepared to be able to rep um, repair. Um, We have um, a brick wall in the back that needs to be repaired. We had a lamp or outside light put in, and when the gentleman put that in, he went through the wall in order to get to the electric, and the bricks were coming loose. He said we need the mortar repaired. Um, every place needs to be dug out and repaired um, through the whole back wall, and right now I just can't afford to do all that. And with these additions that Amadi and Joe wanna make, if that happens to do anything to the back of my house, I don't know how I'm going to repair that. When we had the um, my, what's that? the uh, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. When we had the um, earthquake that come through, it unevened all of the um, the bricks, uh, the cement blocks in the back of my house. That's not that much of an issue, but it caused me to have roof problems. And I went round and round with all state. Well, let's, I understand you've got some issues, but we need to focus on okay. the, the project so, that's before But it's us taken today. me, because of those issues in that letter, it's taken me a long time to be able to have that repaired. Okay. We just recently had a rubber roof put on. Um, so I'm just worried about a lot of potential problems that could come because of all this construction. Um, like I said, I'm going to have no view on either side. And, you know, I have a five-year-old niece that we take care of every day, almost every day. And she's in the alley, she wants to ride her bike, and right now she's only five, so we can't leave her out there alone. Somebody goes out and does watch her in the alley. But as she gets a little bit older, she's gonna to wanna to go out there and ride. There's a family up the street that has a couple little girls, and she's gonna to to go out and ride her bike. And I don't feel comfortable leaving her out there with not being able to see in either direction to be able to watch her. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Prattle? Sure. Um, 
Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Yeah, I think uh, we actually finally got an opportunity, Ms. Surges and Ms. Mahoney and I, to discuss this out in the hall uh, prior to the appeal, and I think we were on the right track prior to presenting in front of this board. Some of the things that I've suggested in regards to the problems with Ms. Mahoney's home is to have our contractor and engineer come out and survey and monitor the condition of her house both prior to and during the eventual construction process. I think that's something that Ms. Surges is amenable to, and we'd be more than happy to do that. I mean, they've been neighbors, the two of them, for 13 years and have a good relationship, and we'd love to continue this. In regards to the view, you know, we have no control over what's on the north side of this property. Uh, and it's you know just being a fence, you know, they could put the same situation here. In regards to the way that um, it, my understanding, Ms. Mahoney looks out onto the alley would be on through the first floor. You know, our first floor proposed addition is only going six feet into the rear yard. And if it were just to be that, that comes within inches of complying with the required rear yard setback already in this zoning district. The majority of the variance is required for the second story addition, both in terms of lot coverage as well as the rear yard. So that is not something that we're really even asking for. It's, it's a matter of inches to meet the 25-foot rear yard requirement setback. The majority of it is on the second floor, which would not impact these issues. And there, even with the second floor addition, there's still an 18-foot rear yard, which matches a number of blocks on, on the house already. Um, and so I think I'll just leave it at, at, the, at that for, for right now. All right, thank you. Any questions from the board? I don't have any questions. Great. Great. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next case, 2019-64-210 East Lafayette Avenue. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to ask for a postponement. I retained counsel to handle this, and uh, he just got back from vacation, so. Uh, it, okay. We, we will postpone your case. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Yoku? Yes. Okay. Next case is 2019-75, 30, 34 and a half Pinewood Avenue. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. Yes. What's your name? Ms. Coles as well, Christina Coles. Okay. Ms. Coles, we have this as uh, to increase from two dwelling units to three dwelling units. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Do we have any staff reports? Yes. Thank you. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is already authorized for use as two dwelling units. However, it is zoned R3, which makes the multifamily dwelling use a non-conforming use in this particular zoning district. And the proposal to begin to use the basement as a dwelling unit would constitute an expansion of a non-conforming use, which the zoning code does not authorize the board to approve. Therefore, the department recommends disapproval of the application because the board is not authorized to approve an expansion of a non-conforming use, which the existing multifamily dwelling unit is in the R3 zoning district where it is located. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Coles, would you uh, tell us about your project, number one, and number two, I'd like you to address the points raised by Mr. French. Yes, I would like to address the points because I wish I had known of this long before now because I was led to this board, not that I made a decision to come on my own. What I did was last um, August was I registered the property online with Baltimore City as they request. And um, I then got an email stating that the property needed to be inspected. And they sent an inspector out, Mr. Campbell. And Mr. Campbell stated a few things that needed to be done. Um, he also stated that if it was going to be a three unit dwelling, that each dwelling would have to have their own electric electric meter and gas meter as well. So I contacted BG&E to start this request. Mr. Campbell came back out and um, he said everything was fine. He saw where um, um, it had been put in with um, BG&E for 
the meters to be installed. Um, they also told me I needed to get a lead test and they told me I needed to get um, that inspection. I got the lead test, it passed without any problems and the inspection passed without any problems. So then later I hear that um, I need to go to zoning. So I go to zoning and I explain to them what it is that I'm trying to do. And then they tell me that there's an appeal board. So after over $20,000 has been spent to do all of this work, uh, I'm, t I'm being told that it's left up to um, you guys, the appeal board. And um, all along the way, I'm spending money and I'm, I haven't been told that it's against the rules of the city to have three dwellings. I was told that two years ago it was approved, it was approved to only have two. So after my inspections and everything was good, I got another tenant. I have two very good tenants along with the co-owner who is my daughter. She's a full-time student. She and her husband were living there. They are no longer together. Um, she works part-time, so we needed the tenants to help pay the mortgage because I am retired from the military and I receive Social Security now, so I cannot continue to pay part of the mortgage as I had been doing. So I have very good tenants. I have no problems with them. I don't think they have any problems with me. They never, there are no trouble in the neighborhood. One is a disabled veteran and the other one is a disabled adult. So there are three tenants who live in the building and there are no issues or no problems. The three houses to the right of my property have three units and I didn't think it was an issue until I got to this point to find out that two years ago the law was changed. I was told by zoning that it can, um, it was approved for two units and if it wasn't three units already that it couldn't be changed. Well, that's like I said, that's yeah. after 20,000, over $20,000 has been spent. Yeah, I, I, again, we're, I don't know the history of your property. I mean, I do know, what we know is that it's in an R3 district and we know that expansion of what's considered a non-conforming use is just not permitted in an R3 district. No, it was already two. Mr. Bumgarner, are we missing anything here? No, the, the, the filing for the work permits, uh, when you were doing the work in the interior of the property, um, were, were uh, commercial building permits um, issued by the Department of Housing um, and Community Development for that work. Okay, what work are you speaking of? Whatever work was done to the okay, interior the property. The work the last that was done years. was electrical, so okay. it was, the wiring was redone okay. to change it to three instead of two. But did the um, permit have that information on it, or was it merely? I'm sure it did. It, on, on the internet, under housing, it states that the work to be done was to the basement. And it stated on my application that I was requesting, and I think I have some of that paperwork here now, requesting that the basement be made the third dwelling. Okay. Because the way that the process should work is that when you file for the building permit, you would also be filing for what's called a use and occupancy permit or an, um, 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 an occupancy permit, which would list that three dwelling units. Yes. That would then be sent to the zoning office, which is under the Department of Housing, that would then review it before any building permits were issued. So the idea is that they review it to make sure that the actual use of the property is permitted before any work is done on the property. Um, well, I'm sure the uh, person that, uh, the company that did the work because I kept hearing them saying that um, they have to close out the permit, they have to file for the d permit, and they asked me who the name, names of the people who were doing the work. BG&E hired a contractor. I hired um, someone to do the rewiring. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the work permits that were issued, and it refers to a basement apartment, but it doesn't refer to a total number of dwelling units. 
and then there was a There was a use permit applied for in 2018 to use as two dwelling units. Um, is that something um, that you had filed or the contractor had filed? It's a use permit, use 2018-54504. Looks like uh, I don't have a date here. Um, okay, I didn't file for anything okay. for two. Uh, on the paperwork that I have, it says three. When okay. it was inspected, it says three. Do you want to show us what you have here? Okay. This is um, for the lead uh, inspector. It says basement. This is for the city inspection. It says three. This is to create, this is from the city, an additional unit for the basement um, where they charge me a fee for that. <laughs> it says basement. Mr. Chairman, I have a feeling that the permits never went to zoning. Uh, that's what it appears. Um. I'm sorry, say that again, Mr. Bumgarner. I, I just I have a feeling that for whatever reason, and I don't know why, um, that the, the zoning office, which is under the Department of Housing, um, that um, that permit request was never forwarded to the zoning office. Because they would have, um, in the course of their work, they would, insp they would um, look at the property to see um, what it was currently zoned for, what it was currently authorized for, and if a building permit, the use of it wouldn't match the existing um, use of the property, they would flag it and then deny the permit. The uh, Baltimore City Rental Inspection Form listed as three dwelling units. Um, but again, my guess is that never made it to. Yeah, zone. property inspection is a whole, yeah. whole separate yeah. office. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm not sure what we at this board can do uh, to help you and I understand exactly what you're saying we're looking at these documents um, and then they do reflect three units but as Mr. Baumgartner said it appears that um, no one was communicating with the zoning office as this process was going through mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman the applicant can request a postponement and we can pull that permit from 2018 as well as the work permits um, I don't have access to it here but yeah. the the city's permit system will allow you to see what which departments are notified about which appear or, um, um, about a which permits so we would able, we'd be able to see when it was sent to the fire department when it was sent to um, the various departments that might be a good idea I mean you'd have to request a postponement we'll grant it if you request it but that'll give us a chance to do a little more digging so it's up to you Yes, I would like to. Okay. I've spent a lot of time. It's been over a year. A lot of time and a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Understood. I've been stressing while I've been <laughs> in school. <laughs> stressing. All right, do you want us to keep these as part of the record? Would you like these back? If you need them, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Don't you need them? Yeah, we don't need them. You need them. Yeah, um, it's entirely up to you. I can write down the uh, permit number and I can give them back to you or we can okay. keep them in the file. It's whatever you prefer, ma'am. Okay, well, if you could write down the permit number. In fact, I, um, sure. I think I have something. There. Okay, now this has a permit number on it. I don't know if that's what you need. Yeah, okay. So, ma'am, you can take these back okay. if you would. Okay. 2019 75 30, 34 and a half Pinewood Avenue is postponed. We will uh, give you notice 
uh, when hopefully we'll get you back in two weeks. Okay. Uh, but it may be four weeks. We meet every other week. So it just depends, you know, when we can get you back in. But we'll okay. give you notice. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yes. The gentleman from Rogers Avenue has heard from his contractor. Okay. Uh, we'll call 2018-425, 3804 West Rogers Avenue. Okay. Let's, now let's get back on our docket, running through the docket. 2019-88, 2030 Alisana Street. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, Joe Woolman on behalf of the applicant. He's standing to my, actually, I'll stand over here if you don't mind. He's standing to my right. Let me get right sworn in. I swear we're from the testimony. Mr. Wolman, we have this to use premises as animal clinic with short-term convalescence. Is that true? It is. Um, it's uh, obviously from your reaction to that, it is a little bit of an unusual case. Well, let me, let me see if we have staff reports to get into your case. Okay, thank you. The planning department reviewed this application, noted that this particular property is within the Fells Point Historic District, the Chesapeake Bay Critical Area, and the designated floodplain area of Baltimore City. Therefore, there are going to be a whole series of permit reviews uh, if this thing should be approved by the zoning board. This property is in the C1 district, in which kennels are not listed as a permitted or conditional use, and therefore are not allowed. The issue that the planning department was concerned about was that the floor plans appeared to show approximately 1,000 square feet of floor area out of a total floor area of approximately 3,000 square feet designated as dog banks, cat waiting, or cat ward, an additional 900 square feet of floor area designated as play area or daycare play area, presumably for animals. And this would indicate, combining these two categories or groups, Approximately 60% of the floor area of the proposed use would be used in a way that the applicant would need to certify would not qualify for the definition of kennel, which is a business where three or more dogs or cats over six months old are boarded or maintained by a person other than the owner. <coughs> the applicant is also proposing external modifications to the building, which will require review by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. The Department of Planning is recommending that approval of this application, if granted, be subject to the conditions that the proposed animal clinic is completed in accordance with an authorization to proceed issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation and with all permits related to the location of the property in the Chesapeake Bay critical area and the designated floodplain overlay district. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Wolman, were we to approve this uh, appeal, are those conditions acceptable to you? Yes, they are. Um, I can state for the record we've already been to CHAP regarding this property, uh, regarding the commercial redevelopment of this property, and I'm confident any design changes we can uh, have reviewed by staff at CHAP and, and continue to proceed under the same uh, notice to proceed that we've already received from CHAP. So tell me why we don't have a kennel here. <laughs> well, first of all, I'll hand out uh, for the members of the board and staff uh, some renderings and floor plans for your reference. Um, as you've noted, this is uh, an unusual case in terms of the use. Um, imagine that I have an unusual case before this board. Um, the code doesn't specifically address uh, what our proposed use is. Animal clinic, as the staff report has already indicated, is a permitted use in a C1 district. A kennel is not permitted in a C1 district. I'll give you the definition of those two things in the code. Animal clinic in general means an establishment used by a licensed veterinarian for the immunization, diagnosis, or treatment of animals or for surgery on animals and for boarding animals during their treatment or convalescence. Uh, animal clinic does not include a kennel. Kennel is defined under the code as a business where three or more dogs or cats over six months old are boarded or maintained by a person other than their owner. Um, with me is Mr. Vincent Bradley, who's the CEO and founder of Heart and Paw, 
Uh, I think Baltimore is going to be very excited to have Hart and Paul come into this market. They are a Philadelphia-based company. He can speak more to the history of the company and to his background. It is a veterinary-based uh, business. There is a veterinarian who manages this entire uh, business. I asked uh, on a call with him recently to, to list the services that the uh, clinic would provide. Uh, and they are in sort of order of an importance and, and in terms of uh, amount of use of, of the structure. Number one, a veterinary general practice. Uh, number two, an urgent care facility. Number three, an outpatient surgery facility. Number four, grooming. Number five, daycare. Number six, there will be local retail for pet-related items. And, and, and finally, there will be an overnight, uh, what we refer to as a pet enrichment uh, treatment aspect of the business. Uh, this is not your typical uh, kennel in terms of what people think of when they think of kennel. Uh, we've reached out to Councilman Cohen uh, regarding this application and he was excited and felt that this was a, a needed amenity in the neighborhood and thought it was a great plan for the property. Uh, we've also, as of today, uh, Ms. Denise Whitman, who I think some of the board members may be familiar with, a, a longtime community activist uh, in the Fells Point area, happens to live right across the street uh, from this facility and we were able to meet with her prior to appearing before you and I'm pleased to report she gave me permission to speak for her uh, that while she initially had some concerns um, Mr. Bradley uh, more than sufficiently addressed those concerns and she is in support of the request. I've also had conversations with Mr. French regarding the planning department's position and I think he and I are both in agreement that this is uh, sort of the classic uh, round peg square or square peg round hole situation where we've got a code that does not specifically address these doggy daycare type facilities that offer such a, a wide uh, and integrated uh, list of services. Um, I can certainly have Mr. Bradley speak to you regarding uh, the overnight aspect and the integration of all the services. I would note in the eastern portion of the parking lot on the rendering, you'll see a large green space. We're dedicating that to the community as a community dog park, which Ms. Whitman and the neighbors were very excited about, uh, something that's also greatly needed in the neighborhood. But with that, I'll have Mr. Bradley uh, speak to you a little bit about, about Hart and Paul. Good afternoon. I founded Hart and Paul. I most previously was the president and CEO of Banfield Pet Hospital, which you may know is a national business uh, based in Portland, Oregon, where we had about a thousand locations. When I left there a couple years ago, I really wanted to found my own business that really provided an integrated experience for today's pet parent which uh, Joe just mentioned around some of our services. Well, yes, it's centered around a veterinary hospital of general practice, which in essence, there's typically in general practice three kind of buckets of services that we just mentioned around wellness care, urgent care, and then outpatient surgery, um, along with integrating that with grooming and daycare and then overnight stay. And so really, in, in the sense that it's all under the, under the direction of a partner veterinarian who will lead the practice, who will lead that center, um, and we're excited to bring that to Baltimore and the Fells Point is really a flagship location for us um, that, that we're you know, prepared to invest significantly in what you see in front of you. And I'm excited about it and um, look forward to answering any questions you have. So, so the only over, any overnight stay is related to hospital care? No, it's really, it's um, not, no, we really, really will be a, a pet parent who may take advantage of our grooming services, veterinary, as well as mm -hmm. having their dog stay overnight. And that would be under, the, again, the direction of the partner veterinarian is part of that. You'll see there a dog bank, as you saw, or a cat ward, that's a part of any veterinary hospital that would have, you know, when you're not treating a pet that's under your care, they would certainly be, then you need to sort of have the dogs or cats somewhere, and that's what those were for. Um, but really, as you look at that and you see, I think you saw what you mentioned of a play area, et cetera, um, you shouldn't think of doggy daycare, at least in our context, of just dropping your dog off and, you know, dogs never never really attended to, et cetera, throughout the day or night. It's really an enriching experience uh, that we believe is uh, a, a need for the community and a great amenity. So, so um, just to drill in, because it, I get the dog bank. That's where, you know, my dog just had surgery. So that's where she mm -hmm. sat b before she went to have surgery. Yes. But on your plants, it says large dog overnight. Yes. So it, the question is, is that where dogs who have had surgery need to recover overnight and stay? Or is that if I need to come and bring my dog so I can go out of town, you're boarding my dog while I'm out of town? Yeah, your dog would stay overnight, yes. <laughs> while I'm out of town. So it's boarding. Well, it's boarding in the sense, it, 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 we, we've, got, we've got an issue here with definitions and terms and things like that, <laughs> yes. without a doubt. Um, and it, it board, it's, it's boarding in a sense that a dog stays overnight and it's not necessarily recovering from 
treatment if it's if it's someone heading out of town. Uh, the issue is with with the term kennel and boarding and its and its prohibition under the code the way it's written. I think we're all in agreement after having a lot of discussions about this case and, and the proliferation of these type of facilities in, in various neighborhoods. We need one in my neighborhood too. The code needs to, frankly, be amended. So uh, I, I think. Important to this case, though, is the fact that, that uh, per Mr. Bradley's uh, uh, testimony, it, it's not just an overnight stay where you drop your dog off and you leave it overnight. There is, there's pet enrichment programs that are being applied at the direction of the, vet, of the veterinarian that's, that's overseeing the whole operation regarding the overnight stay as well as daytime care. So it's not a kennel in the sense when you think of a traditional or old school kennel where dogs are just kept in cages for long periods of time, and, and I don't think we meet that. So definition it's there. It's cage-free boarding is what you're saying. Um, I wouldn't say cage-free. There can be a variety of, of ways for, so actually in some instances the dogs need to kind of have, you know, time out if you will, or kind of separated from the pack. There's other times where it's really great for the dog to be enriched as a group. So we'll have all of those instances and opportunities for the dog. So Would any, is, go ahead. What is pet enrichment? Well, I, I mean, I'm sure Mr. Bradley can speak to it better than I can, but my understanding from, from calls both with him and with the veterinary, uh, the veterinarian on, on, the, on the facility is that there are various activities and things that are monitored, et cetera. I'm, yeah, so I'm sure you can answer better than I'm trying to. In the, in, the, <laughs> in the play areas, there'll be, you know, toys. There'll be both big monolith type of structures, et cetera, for the dogs to play in. Um, socialization of dogs in a pack is also part of enrichment. You know, our ratio between pet and staff is going to be quite elevated in comparison to what you might see, um, where I think you know, there really aren't any standards as it relates to uh, of this in the industry, but we've set a standard of 12 to 1 ratio. So for every 12 dogs, there'll be a staff person. So, you know, that's a pretty good ratio in regards to interaction with a uh, staff member. Is not The dogs aren't going to be left alone to sort of fend for themselves, so to speak. And so those are some examples of enrichment. But, I mean, dogs are pack animals, as you, I'm sure, know. And so interacting and socializing with other dogs in a controlled environment is really important for their behavior. Would any temporary boarding um, be the principal use of the property or merely um, accessory to the other uses? No, if you look at the floor plans and if you, and if you consider the list I gave you, it would definitely be, be subordinate in size and, and scope uh, of use for the facility. Um, the other services that are higher up on that list are certainly more, more towards the principal use. And again, I think the principal uses of the property certainly meet the definition of an animal clinic, which is a permitted use uh, in the C1 district. How many veterinarians and or vet techs um, would you anticipate being at this location? Yeah, great question. So we'll, uh, as the business ramps, that will obviously grow. So we'll start with two veterinarians and the, reg the, the needed support staff for her. Uh, and then if you look at that floor plan, uh, there are four exam rooms, a surgery suite, et cetera. Um, I've managed hundreds of, of those that are smaller than that that had six or seven doctors. So there's opportunity for our capacity to grow as the as the market grows, as the community need grows. And so, but by far, if you looked, you know, if I had our pro forma, if you will, looking out three to five years, veterinary will remain um, the, the majority of the both use and revenue, uh, both in the beginning as well as through our, th you know, through the next five years. So for both grooming, a doggy daycare and overnight will, I, I don't, I'd rather not use the word ancillary because I think, again, if I go back to the word I used before around integrating the service for today's pet parent is important, but nonetheless, if I looked at it on, say, a pie chart that had the revenue by function or by service or capacity, veterinary would be greater, much greater than 50% followed by, you know, followed by grooming and daycare and then and probably, you know, kind of in the rear would be the overnight. Okay. Any other questions from the board? All right. Thank you very, thank much. very much. Thank you. Uh, let's call again 2018 425 3804 West Rogers Avenue. Okay. Yeah, I have it. Okay, what do you have for us? Sure. Let me ask, uh, since we have this on a screen of a, of a cellular phone, why don't you just, it's fairly short, why don't you just read that into the record, sure. please? Yeah, like I said earlier, this is from my contractor, uh, affiliate 
construction is uh, to whom it may consign. Affiliate construction LLC uh, license under the Maryland Home Improvement Commission along with our personnel have completed renovation work and done a detailed inspection of 3804 West Rogers Avenue, Baltimore, MD 21215. This is to confirm and inform you that the dwelling at the above address is constructed as a multi-family dwelling with three separate units that include their own electric meters in each unit. Unit one has its separate entrance, while unit two and three has a main entrance, but uh, two second floor in which both units are constructed separately. This unit are separate first air heating systems, which contain dock work specific to each unit. In addition, each unit has separate plumbing and water heaters. This, the way in which this dwelling is designed, both structurally and mechanically, would make it difficult and costly to try to convert it to a single unit. This structure is best suited for its existing and intended use. Any question regarding this work performed Please contact Marcos Aronson on the phone number 4240-426-3190, project manager signed. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any uh, What does that tell us that we didn't know? Yeah, because uh, Mr. Derek said I need something to support so that you know uh, from uh, a contractor Perspective. Since we don't have like a paper tray showing, you know, some information, uh, especially from BG or you know previous tenant. Any of that information is relevant uh, for the board. Um, for this particular application, the 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 issue is abandonment and or uh, discontinuance. So for a lot of these properties, they were flipped to multifamily decades ago, and there's not even a permit paper trail for them. So having something on the record to state that, that they were, in fact, lawfully used, or at least they were structurally built as three units, uh, is helpful to establish that they at once, um, at one particular time, had three dwelling units. But again, the, the issue, the very narrow issue before this board is whether or not in that zoning district, because of this property, if those three dwelling units had uh, were continually used up until now um, and that that third unit was not lost and that hasn't been shown that's up for this board to determine okay any other questions from the board all right thank you very much thank you sir next case 2019-90 west side of elm street 172 feet one inch uh, <coughs> northwest of 33rd street cheryl wilson Let's get everybody who's going to provide testimony sworn in. Raise your right hands, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're Be about to give? Be testimony. I do. Okay. Swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. All right, Ms. Wilson, we have this to construct a new three-story detached building uh, with two dwelling units. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Do we have staff reports? Uh, Mr. Chair, we have a ream of letters, so bear with me. Uh, first, we have Councilwoman Clark's letter that she um, submitted to the BMZA, and since she's here today, she's going to testify in lieu of us reading in the entire letter, uh, but I have assured her that it is here and it is part of the record. Um, secondly, we have a letter from the Hamden Community Council, who is in opposition uh, to this appeal. Uh, who is, it's signed by Mr. Matt Stegman, who is not here, but uh, we're told that uh, uh, they, there is somebody that's going to stand in, has been appointed to speak on his behalf. So again, we won't read the entirety of this letter, but it is noted that it is uh, the Hampton Council, Community Council's letter of opposition is 
uh, a part of the record. Go ahead. We're also requesting a postponement today. I want to make sure that's on the record before we start. Identify yourself. Nate Prettel, um, on behalf of the Hamden well, Community let's, Council. Let's, let's do one thing at a time. Let's finish with staff reports, then we'll entertain the uh, request for postponement. If it's okay, we can proceed? Yep. Thank you. Okay, the, the rest of these letters are from individuals and noted that there are a lot of people in the crowd, so rather than be redundant, I just want to make sure I'm not reading anybody that's, already, that's here to testify. So Melissa Swanson. Okay, we'll read that. Uh, Kate McCulloch. Okay, so rather than reading your letter, you it, would you rather, would you like me to read this in? Sure. Okay. Uh, Ethan McLeod. Read it. Philip Gear. Sarah Nays, Nice, uh, Nasheed Coleman, Carol Swanson, and Cindy Maddox. Okay, so we're going to read these letters in just so we have them in. Uh, first is uh, Cindy Maddox. Uh, I'm contacting you concerning the proposed new dwelling construction at 3320 Elm Ave. My husband and I purchased the house five doors down from this property in question two years ago. While we have not lived on the street for a long time, it is very easy to fall in love with our small corner of Baltimore. We have a very small, quiet street and lovely engaged community with people of all ages. I have concerns with the proposed structure relating to its large size. It will extend well beyond uh, 17 feet, the well beyond the current adjacent houses of similar style of one large house per lot. This will totally box in the houses next door, limiting the current views and light tremendously. Additionally, the owner is requesting a variance to allow the building to extend right up to the south property line. This would reduce the distance between the new house and 3318 to approximately five feet, creating an exceptionally narrow alley between the two houses, which will look much different than the rest of the street, creating a much less functional space for 3318 and seems unsafe. We have spoken with the owner who is unwilling to consider any size reduction or how this home would change the look and feel of our 100-year-old uh, feel of our 100, 100 year I'm assuming uh, home this larger size is to accommodate two a two unit investment property which will crowd our neighbors next door and entirely fill the the very enjoyable and used green space that we've been living with for years signed Cynthia, Cynthia Maddox the next is an email from Carol Swanson I'm writing to express my concerns regarding the zoning variances requested in the reference to Peel proposed structure would be the only multifamily dwelling on a narrow one-way street of single-family dwellings parking along Elm Avenue and Harding places at a premium now and although the building plans show parking area on the lot for four vehicles there's no guarantee that these will be utilized at all times by the residents to accommodate off-street parking an oversized structure requires a variance to the maximum pervious surface of 60 percent for the multifamily dwelling the proposed variance would cover 100 percent of the existing lot this increases potential for runoff and erosion of downslope areas the proposed entrance to this parking area is at the corner of harding place and, and falls cliff road an area that has a somewhat limited visual sight line to the traffic approaching from the south Let me go on uh, the proposed structure, if at all, if all the requested variances are granted, will occupy almost 100% of the existing lot and will eliminate a much enjoyed green space view of current residents. I'm hoping that you strongly consider these points against granting the requested variances. The proposed structure is not compatible with nor in keeping with the surrounding neighborhood. Thank you for your consideration. Signed, Carol Swanson. Next is Mr. Nasheed Coleman email I'm sending this email to you with great concern regarding the proposed oversized investment project at 3320 LMF the proposed project will not only have a negative effect on the property that I am under contract to purchase just 3318 Elm but on the entire neighborhood by eliminating green space blocking light and views of existing single-family homes and creating safety concerns with a parking area existing dangerously close to a congested intersection with the proposed altering of numerous setback requirements, this project will be sandwiched on my property line, making it mandatory for me to relocate my front entrance stairs, my AC unit, and the stairs in my the stairs to my rear deck. This letter from Sarah Knees. 
I live at 3316 Elm Ave and have uh, some personal concerns about the proposed structure. I'm a school teacher and cannot attend the hearing, but I was hoping I could voice those concerns to you here. What I love most about my home is the green space surrounding. The back patio overlooks large trees, lar a large yard, trees, and a lot of nature. The proposed building extends almost 20 feet beyond the existing homes, which totally boxes in half of our yard. The proposed building also has decks that will tower over my patio and will overlook uh, my backyard, totally impeding the privacy and serenity of my backyard space. I do not have a deck as some other homes, so this structure would box in my backyard. Another major concern is the placement of the driveway and, and parking at the very busy intersection of Roland Avenue meets Harding Place and Falls Cliff where the Fox Building has increased heavy traffic. Add to that cars parking along Falls Cliff and it's a recipe for traffic safety concerns. It is often difficult for me to make the turn from Roland to Falls Cliff and I am two houses, from, uh, two houses over from the intersection where the proposed driveway will be. We are sad to see that this tiny bit of green space be, uh, become another large structure. While we do appreciate the efforts to make the front blend in with the existing homes, the massive size of the structure, which will be 100% paved from the front sidewalk to the parking access, is a detriment to our environment. My neighbors across the street spend a lot of time on their front porches, getting in the little bit of nature that is left as they, as they do not have backyards. Instead, they have the post office parking lot. Our block has several people who have been trying to find out who owned the lot with dreams of creating a community garden and playground as we have several families with small children here. We already have a massive apartment complex as our neighbor, the Fox Building, and we would like to minimize the impact of adding more renters instead of homeowners to help keep our Elm, Ave blocks, Elm Avenue block safe and supportive. Again, Sarah Nees and C.J. Johnson. Next is from Philip Gear. I purchased 3310 Elm Ave two years ago with my wife. Our block is small with houses on either side of our tiny bit of Elm. We know our neighbors well and enjoy cookouts with them, passing time on the porches, helping band together to report on longstanding drug houses, etc. In short, we fell, uh, we fell in very quickly with our small corner of Hamden and Baltimore. My concerns for the proposed construction are as follows. One, the back of the house would extend 17 feet beyond the houses on the side of the block, drastically limiting our neighbors' views of light. We all enjoy the backyards and think the sudden limitation would have a huge impact on our lifestyles. Two, the amount of variances required to allow construction is astounding, completely ignoring safety requirements and protection against, the construct, against constructing something totally out of place in a neighborhood. For example, the owner is requesting a variance to allow the building to extend right up to the south property line. This would reduce the distance between the new house and 3318 to approximately five feet, creating an exceptionally narrow. Uh, and three. The owner of 3320 Elm is completely unwilling to listen to our or, our or my neighbor's concerns as to how this new construction would change the look and feel of our 100-year-old community. She is defensive and dismissive. I have no issue with her seeing this construction as an investment opportunity, but her oversized idea will crowd our neighbors next door and entirely fill a very enjoyable green space we have been living with for years. Ethan McLeod. A developer, Cheryl Wilson, has said that the plans to build a new structure on the property with two dwelling units, one, with, one of which would, have, would be a house and the other which would contain two condominiums, all with, separate, all with separate entrances. At a meeting with the neighbors on Sunday, at which Councilwoman Clark was present, Wilson said her plans fit with the, within the R6 zoning of the area, but she'll need to request a number of variances. We are opposed to the developer's plans for the property for the following reasons. Her designed property would eliminate the remaining green space in the neighborhood. Um, the developer said yesterday that she lives in Windhurst, is a lawyer and is currently not working and wants to be able to build with the density on the property for the explicit purpose of generating enough profit from rentals so she can retire. Her stated plans are entirely in for personal gain and at the expense of neighbors surrounding the property. If the variances are granted, she would be building the structure right up to the property line, a three-story row house that's, that, that someone is planning to purchase and restore. We worry that the buyer will back out of the deal. It's still under contract if these variances are approved. 
Her plan structure would exceed, excuse me, would extend many feet beyond the adjacent homes on that side of the street, effectively boxing them out and taking away from their deck views in their backyard. The size scale of, of the developer's plan development is obtrusive and not at all in line with the rest of the properties on our block. And two more. <clears throat> It's from Kate McCulloch. 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 I've been living at the th on the 3300 block of Elm Ave for the last few years. It's a tiny block set apart from the rest of Elm right below the post office. It is one-way street. Our alleys are so small, trash is picked up uh, up front. As long as I've lived here, there has been talk of the open green space on the corner, how we could pay the back taxes and buy for as a community how it could be a garden, a place for the kids to play. Unfortunately, the lot went to auction without our knowledge and it was bought by an investor. Our initial disappointment grew to concern, grew to concern when we realized the intended plans for the space. Not only was there another house going, to, going up in an already oversaturated neighborhood, but it was going to be enormous. It was going to extend out, I say this way, past all the other houses on the block. It was proposed to cover all the existing green space. Re <clears throat> excuse me. Recently, there has been a lot of development in Hamden neighborhood. Recent townhouses in the Crichton Mansion and the development on the Fox Building have led to augmented traffic and greater difficulty in parking in our tiny neighborhood. The proposed Montrosity will have a driveway located in an already increasing dangerous intersection where Roland, Harding, uh, Elm Ave, and Falls Cliff Road come together. The builder made it clear that our concerns over air, light, enjoyment of nature, and community were no, of no concern to her. Her concern is money. When asked why the home could not be made smaller to fit in with existing houses on the block, she stated that she stated that then she couldn't make enough money. While I understand the need for an income, her blatant disregard for the concerns of the community due to potential gains of her pocketbook were disturbing. In this neighborhood, the houses on the even side of the street date back to the late 1800s and the odd side early 1900s. Although change is inevitable and although the builder is able to do what she wishes with her land, we hope that the zoning board will hear our cry and not allow her to build a property inconsistent with the old community. She stated time and again that due to the need for variances and codes and laws, even the houses already standing couldn't be built here today. Please do not allow her to build something much larger than with what, what than what is already not permitted. I feel that her proposed plans and her need for these variances are based exclusively on a desire to increase her income potential, and I feel that they are injurious to the use and enjoyment of all of our neighbors in immediate vicinity. How'd I do? Okay, okay. Last one from Melissa Swanson. I'm the resident of 3323 Elm Avenue. Part uh, part of uh, part of I decided to part of why I decided to live here was because of the green space that is currently at 3320 Elm. It's nice to have a view of to look at while nice to have a view to look at while sitting out having my morning coffee. Now a developer wants to build a new a new structure on the property. She's proposing a three-story dwelling with two-bedroom apartments. Each apartment will have their own separate entrance. At a meeting with the neighbors and Mrs. Wilson, she said her plans fit within the R6 zoning area, but she still needs to request different variances. I strongly oppose the plans for her property for the following reasons. One, parking. I know that she, has, she would be including four parking spots, but what if more than two people live in each unit? Her design plan would eliminate the remaining green space and take away people's views. Mrs. Wilson's plans are completely for her own financial gain and even admitted that at our neighborhood meeting. The proposed plan has a three feet interior, yards, uh, interior side yard setback. The minimum interior side yard for dwelling in multifamily is 15 feet in the R6 zoning. She wants to take most of the green space that is left. The proposed plan will have a three feet corner yard corner side yard. A minimum corner side yard for multifamily dwelling in R6 is 20 feet. The proposed plan for, will be built to the front yard line. A minimum front yard requirement for R6 zoning for multifamily is lesser of 20 feet of the block average. The proposed plan will box in the neighbors on the same side of the street as 3320 Elm Ave. They won't have, they won't have view, ex, they won't have views, 
aspect of the side of the proposed dwelling. Okay. The proposed plan will have decks that look directly over the neighbor's decks, which offers no form of privacy. Thank you for the time. Melissa Swanson. Uh, very good. Especially that one. Mr. French, please. Thank you. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property measures approximately 23 feet 3 inches wide, an average of 88 feet 4 inches deep, and it is currently unimproved, as you've heard. Uh, there is no record of there ever, ever having been a structure on the property. The requirement for a multifamily dwelling in this particular district is 1,500 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit. Uh, therefore, there would be a requirement for 3,000 square feet of lot area in order to build a proposed structure. However, the department also notes that should a single family st structure be built, it would be the identical amount of lot area required, namely 3,000 square feet. And therefore, construction of any dwelling unit uh, or building, residential building on this property is going to require a variance of the lot area requirement. Uh, the second thing is the side yard variances referred to the street corner variance and the interior side yard variance. Uh, the requirement for the interior side yard is 15 feet, as was mentioned in one of the letters. The requirement for the street corner side is 20 feet. However, the lot is only 23 feet, 3 inches wide. Therefore, in order to build anything on this property, there are going to have to be variances of both of those side yard requirements. The applicant has not, according to the plan submitted to the planning department, requested a variance of the rear yard setback requirement. The proposed development is going to require review by the planning department to see that it meets the standards in the development manual and the landscape manual. The department is recommending approval of this application subject to the condition that all improvements to the property are completed in accordance with plans approved by the Department of Planning in accordance with the reference manuals. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, um, <coughs> if this board were to approve uh, your appeal, uh, are the conditions proposed by planning acceptable? Yes. Okay. So why don't you tell us about your project? Uh, I'd like you to address the standards that this board has to meet in granting variances as you go through your, your presentation. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, I know and I understand how hard this must be when you imagine that something was a green space and it wasn't. I've been mowing it regularly for over a year. Somebody had to mow it. It wasn't a green space. It wasn't a recreation area. And I'm sorry that that's the biggest problem that they're losing their green space. It's that things happen when you build on your property. Um, the other co thing that is mentioned many times is about the one to the south being boxed in. The gentleman, is a, he flips houses. He flips several on that block. There's one window, and most of those houses are duplexes with about five feet in between each duplex. So the five feet is normal for that area, and mine was supposed to be duplexes. But at one point before I owned it, the city uh, confiscated some of the land, probably paid for it, to widen the street in order to make it more accessible for people. So now there's only room for one unit, not two, um, not the regular duplex. But it's still in conformance with how the rest of the street is built. Um, there are not three units, there are two. Somebody mentioned three. Um, and I purposely did separate entrances so that it would look similar to all of the rest of the houses. This is what you see from the front. It looks like a townhouse. On the side, there's another entrance, and that has switchback stairs that go all the way to the top floor. So that's the second unit. Um, it's very, very attractive with high-end materials, hardy plank instead of aluminum siding, brick around like all the rest have for the porches. Um, hardy plank shingles, beautiful quality. Um, Dave Schilling is the builder, and he's very, very familiar with the city. He builds here a lot. He's been building here 30 years. Um, he's had other places in Hamden built as well. Um, the driveway, yeah, the city, we, we were out at the site, and there are three um, roads that connect, come into that area, and um, 
Martin, who's part of the HCC, suggested, well, why don't we have the DOT paint part of that red? There's a strip where it would cut down on a lot of the congestion. The community didn't want it. They were more concerned with being able to park them with safety. So safety, I don't think, is one of the main concerns. Um, it, uh, my house is not 100 feet long. It's 56 feet. Um, light is not an issue because the whole section, the whole length fa faces north. So east-west, everyone has full east-west sunlight in, on their houses. I sent a picture. I'm not sure if you all saw it yet, but this is um, where my stake is circled down there. Do you want to pass it? And the rest of the decks you can see have a view to everything but that part of the house that sticks out. They have a view all the way from, um, is that south, all the way down to the northern part where the house sticks out. Beyond that, there's no houses on the northern side. It is um, green space for the post office. The post office has a green yard and a hill and there's trees. Um, there are also trees along the street where I'm proposing to build. I will not take up all the green space. The city has some of that. It's at least eight feet. So the, plus my house is only 16 feet wide in the front, all the way back 36 feet. So from that point all the way to the city's point will be open space. So it's only 16 feet that's being taken. Um, and then after that, we have the garage. And in order to build a two-car garage, we had to expand it to 20 feet. I asked, could we do it smaller? They said, no, you can't. That's how, how wide a two-car garage has to be by code. So we have the two-car garage plus two places outside of the garage. So there's four parking places. Um, let's see what else we have here, concerns. Uh, um, that's somebody else was interested in the property that they said the builder might back out of the the one who flips properties he was there at the site and he was interested in it and he went into the meeting after we had left I don't know what happened to that but there are other people who would be happy to f build and sell that house as well um, let's see mostly I hear green space green space green space um, Every single comment mentioned it was not a green space. It was somebody's property and who it was maintained. So it was never a green space. People were trespassing. How long have you owned the property? Um, a year and four months. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think that's it for that. But however, let's talk about the um, variances. All of the variances that I'm asking for w are required in order to build there at all. So even I was mentioning to the community if one of their houses burned down, they had to rebuild. Every single thing is a variance. There's no longer a possibility to build on those small lots without variances. So um, unnecessary hardship. I don't see an unnecessary. I have the un, I would have the unnecessary hardship. I couldn't build at all. Um, the the they somebody mentioned that my sole desire was to increase value or income potential of the property. If that were the case, I would have come in here with a condo development, which was what I initially wanted, just like the one a block away. I like it. I think it's well done. It's right on the corner of Hickory and Roland. It has six units. It has parking. That, to me, is a really useful and good way to use that piece of land. That's what I was hoping. And I kept changing my plans because I was told that the community wouldn't accept it. So then I went to a duplex. No, no. That, that isn't going to fly, even though there are duplexes on that block, and I have a picture of it. Back-to-back uh, -back houses. Um, oh, well, it is here somewhere. Oh, hang on. If, if you want to see it, I have a picture of it's it. It's up to you if you want to see it. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. Um, so down at the end, there are two or three. We'll need you to talk in the oh, mic down. At the very end of the street, um, there are two or three houses that have back-to-back Houses, so their single family back to back is also um, allowed and typical for that area. So I could do two single family homes that are smaller, but there's no parking. So they're all street parking. What I'm proposing is four parking spaces off street. So that to me was a much better idea for the community. So all the different plans, and then I had a, a wider plan. Then the architect gave me a bigger house, and I said, no, I don't want that. It isn't going to look right. These houses are 15 feet wide. I measured them, and this is mine's going to be 16 is as far as I will go. She had it bigger, and I didn't feel that that was right. So I have worked with the community. I have thought about this situation. 
Um, there is still going to be some green space. It's going to be a very nice property, well kept. I live here. I, I was there almost every single day in the last year because I would drive by and look at it and see what's going on. Um, is there any other? Uh, I lost it. Here it is. It will not be injurious, injurious to use and enjoyment of other property in the immediate vicinity, and it will increase the value of all of the homes by quite a bit. I, I believe it will only increase because it's going to be new. People love new properties. It will attract more money. They'll see that, whoa, this is really nice. We, should, we can fix ours up like that. And that's what happened where I live. When we fixed ours up, people next door fixed theirs up. So if anything, it's going to be an improvement to the community. Um, it's in harmony with the purpose and intent of the code. It will bring in significant tax revenue for the city. Um, it will not affect the urban renewal plan, the city's master plan, and any historical or architectural preservation. Um, it will not endanger public health, security, welfare, or morals, or in any way be contrary to public interest. Okay. If you're finished, we'll hear from your opposition now. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, president of the Hampton Community Council is streaming this meeting and thinks it's such a good hearing that they, the request for postponement has been postponed and withdrawn. Well, I'm not sure you can postpone a request for a postponement, but we'll take that as well, a Well, he's, he's attempting to do it by internet. Okay. Um, and we're very pleased because we're glad to be here. And I, before I start, if I could, if I could ask everyone who's here from the neighborhood in opposition to this legislation, uh, to this bill, to this zoning appeal, would you please stand so everybody can see you? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, do you mind if I just read this? No, of course not. Here. You are representing yeah. the community council. Please do. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah. Nate Predall here solely on behalf of the Hamden Community Council as a member of his <coughs> board of directors. You should have a, a letter in your file requesting postponement that's been withdrawn. Now we're just uh, expressing our opposition to the appeal. The opposition is based on inadequate information from the developer, a lack of justification for the variances, and our belief that the variances are inappropriate. And I'll mention, it, I think this is especially true in regards to the request for a multifamily dwelling. I think Mr. French made the point that the lot is a uh, configured in a way that nothing could be built uh, by conforming to all the different setbacks. That does not apply to the request for an additional unit. And just because of the fact that if it's a semi-detached dwelling that has a 3,000 square foot lot area, that equals the same for two units, it doesn't mean you're compelled to build multiple units. And I haven't heard anything from a justification for that. And I'll leave it leave it at that. And good Thank luck you. to everyone. Well, let me ask, it sort of that begs the question then, doesn't, would the neighborhood oppose a single family dwelling? Um, I have not reviewed any plans for a single family dwelling, and oh, I'm here. Concept, would they oppose a single I, family I, I can't speak for the neighborhood. I'm, uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll let the community yeah, members here can. who are, but I'm, you know, as a representative of the community council, we haven't discussed that, and I'm not authorized to comment on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Predel. Uh, I wrote out what I wanted to say, so um, I hope it's. Um, quick enough for you, I, it's shorter than my letter. Um, and if I may, you have notebooks there that were distributed to the board. And uh, if I could just begin, oh, I do need it. I just would like you to look at the part that says pictures. Just so you have, in, in this book, the second tab says photos, I'm sorry. And I just wanna just run past. You wanna hold it? Oh. Go ahead. Thank you. So the first picture is of, I got, I got to move this, is the neighborhood. That's the 3300 block of Elm Avenue. <clears throat> You've already heard it's, a, it's really over 100 years old, uh, although it's full of young people as well as people who've been there all their lives. <clears throat> the next picture is this gentleman's house that he put a, he and his partner put a bid in to buy before he found out that um, the, the lot next to it that you see 
is going to be uh, proposed, was proposed for development as this large overgrown um, de development and house. So he's here and he'll speak for himself about his concerns. The next picture <coughs> is the, uh, oh, to the left again is this gentleman's house uh, that is under sales contract um, next to the lot, we call it 3320 Elm, being Miss Wilson's uh, proposed lot. Um, and you can see that it's surrounded by, by roads and it is a very narrow sloping lot. And that's me on the next picture on Sunday holding up a board in the yard <coughs> and, um, and I was allowed to by this gentleman because he has a contract in to show where the, the length and <coughs> the width of that wall of the proposed building would terminate. So you can see how much lower in the yards the solid uh, wall of the proposed building would go and how it comes lower than actually the decks and porches on the back of the existing houses. And it's so close to the next door neighbor at 3318 as well. When, when, when you're yes. holding up this, looks like a four by eight piece of plywood, is this the, does the proposed building stop where you're holding it or the, or the other end of the board? It stops at, no, not where I'm holding it. It, it stops at the end, no. There's a peg in the ground that shows that that is, so the oh. far end of the board is, yes. Okay. Thank you for asking. Okay. Uh, I never thought about that. And finally, this is a photograph from the um, rear of the proposed property and from the next door neighbors. And to the left, you can begin to see part of that post office green space that everybody likes to look look at. Um, and you can also see a hydrant and a, and a pole and uh, other things. But that's where we're talking about. And if I may. Can I, can I just ask one question? Yes, of course. The picture that you have, there are other posts in the ground? Or yes, there are state little stakes. And what do those represent? Those are the survey stakes, and those have been there for over a year. Okay. That's what was, that's the survey stakes that was represented to us as being the boundaries. And we thank you for them, uh, Ms. Walton. So, if I, if I can just read this. Um, good catch. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm here today to oppose and challenge Appeal 2019-90 uh, as unduly oversized for its narrow downhill lot, as a potential traffic hazard in the staging of its off-street parking, as environmentally objectionable in its 100% impervious coverage and stormwater impact. We have here one more discouraging example of seeking to profit from another Hamden green space by developing it within mere inches of its boundaries and seeking to profit from the traditionally harmonious neighborhood, its very plans diminish. This site is a legal non-conforming lot in an R6 zoning district, legal because it shows up on city government maps with boundaries and block lot numbers, non-conforming because it fails to comply with the lot area or with required in this B6 zoning district. In R6, we've already expressed, it's already been said, in R6, one dwelling unit requires 1,500 square feet of uh, land area um, to 3,000 feet, and this particular lot uh, has 2,053 square feet, 33% uh, short of being um, what is required. That's a big gap. In any uh, event, two dwelling units cannot be built here. The code indicates that in such legal non-conforming lots, the right to build is limited to a single family dwelling unit, 
which may, quote unquote, may be erected if the lot meets all other requirements imposed by code. No law compels approval of any development, and we seek denial in the, in the appeal's entirety. In other words, the code allows, and you know this, but I'm saying it for, for all of us here. In other words, the code allows the board to approve a single family dwelling unit, nothing more. The board can deny the entire appeal if it chooses, and we hope so, but if it approves the single family dwelling unit, we ask the required compliance with other code requirements. Um, by denying, restricting uh, the interior corner lot um, from 15 feet required to zero or three feet um, proposed. By reduction of the corner yard lot from the 20 feet required to a three foot setback and increasing the impervious surface from 60% to 100% of lot coverage. So, to approve variances, again, I think we all know this and it's been mentioned, but let me say it again. The board must first make findings, for example, in this case, just the way we do in the city council. Findings that without a variance, the developer faces unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty in developing the property, which is caused, the difficulty, by the requirements of the zoning code, not by the intentional action or inaction of any person who has a present interest in the property. In a community meeting of April 14th, the applicant, I was there, assured a group of neighbors of her professional knowledge of city zoning. With such expertise, she knew what she was getting into but took the intentional action of buying this property nonetheless. She knows this field and that she knows the zoning code. The hardship and difficulty, if any, are self-imposed. In addition, the board must find that the variance is not based exclusively to increase the value of income potential of the property. We've all been to the same meeting. We've all heard the same words. I just happen to have it here, so let me say it again. In that same April 14th meeting, the applicant rejected a suggestion to build just one dwelling unit on the lot instead of two, explaining that she intended this rental income for her retirement. It is clear that the variance is exclusively to maximize the income to retire. Finally, the board must find that a variance would not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of other properties in the immediate vicinity. Residents on the west side of the 3,300 block of Elm Avenue have complained most of all about the excessive length of the proposed new building and how that long solid wall would wall out their own row of rear porches and decks from current views of the post office green space to the north. It's just a wide open, lovely, country-like village environment. The wall would also interfere with the neighbor's privacy by allowing new residents to look directly down, down on activities on those porches and decks. Nobody's expecting a peeping Tom but it's an uncomfortable feeling when people can do that and you can't see, the, you, people can watch you and you can't see them. Immediately next door, the contract purchasers of 3318 Elm Avenue knew nothing of this proposed development until the April 14th meeting. Instead of a green lot and view, they now face a three foot setback between themselves and a long, high wall for them too close for comfort. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, please deny this repeal, this appeal, and thank you for your attention and consideration. Thank you. 
I'd like, like, I'm oh, sorry. I'd like to it. just let you know that 3320 is the official address. It, I was given that on March 20th by Wesley Shaw in um, right of way. So that is official, 3320. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we've been using it. Uh, who, how many more people we, are intending to testify? Right okay. Three are uh, testifying. Okay. And, and we... You, we, we get what we've heard so far, so if, if, if we don't need to have it repeated, but please, you know, feel uh, free to talk. It's important for the next door neighbor to be heard. 3318, uh, uh, my name is Javed Nasser. 3318 um, uh, Malm Avenue. What's your name? J-A-V-E-D. Last name N-A-S-I-R. <coughs> I'm under yes. count. Nasir, N-A-S-I-R. I'm under contract for 3318 uh, Elm Avenue, which is very next door. I will be sandwiched, sandwiched against this humongous property right next door. Not just I have to move my um, front steps, air conditioner, to go back access to my um, deck in the back. From the balconies next door, the people will be looking into my bedroom windows from from the property this you're going to live in the property yes i will be fixing it up either i will be living or renting the property i have other properties in the city as well and this structure what is being built is going to be people looking right into a, not just the decks or something but looking into bedrooms that's that's what it is uh, mr I, chairman i have a quick question sure. um i'm sorry to um, um to um interrupt sir but both for uh, yourself um uh, Councilman Clark, Mr. Preddle, if he's still here, um, any of you can answer this question. This application requires a number of different variances. Correct. Rear yard is not one of them. That's so there's no rear yard variance requested under this application. That's correct. So in our 6th district, there's a 25 foot requirement for all the yards. And they have 31. Great. So the picture that you have with you and the board, that's showing where the building will be built back to the rear, correct? It's showing the past. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. You're not. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, for the uh, court reporter. Um, uh, when I. Uh, when I took that had had that picture taken, mm -hmm. it was my understanding from our meeting and and little talk walk around the property with Miss Wilson that that stake represented the rear of the main structure that she was proposed is proposing to build and the side of how and the side of the main structure so that it was both things and there was a in the ground there was a, that's as far back as the main structure goes and the and and as far uh, uh west east as far cl as close as it gets to um, the next door neighbor if I'm understanding these plans correctly though she can build back to that point by right which which where the rear of that building is proposed to stop she can do that by right there is no variance requested under this application there is no rear uh, variance rear um, yard variance yard so that variance requested and it's because she's she's got 31 feet from the road so my point, and I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get from testimony, is that if, if she can build back to that line by right, and every other property owner in this block can build back to that line by right, how is that blocking anyone's view? How about the side setback? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can, let me just think about, can, we, can I just for a moment, sure. could you forgive me for a minute? I'm not, sure, sure, you're sure. not cutting you off. Okay, we're going to do this one at a time okay. as opposed to people just jumping in. So okay. yeah, council, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, what are you saying to, to us? So when you have a number of properties in a row, whether they're attached row homes or they're mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. properties, like a lot of these are, okay. if you go in the backyard, of any of the properties mm -hmm. and you look to your left and you look to your right depending upon how that neighborhood was platted sometimes the back of the buildings are front a little bit back a little bit stagger or they're mm -hmm. all the same yeah in this particular zoning district mm -hmm. the zoning code says you can build back as far as you want mm -hmm. until that rear property line as long as you have a 25 foot rear yard mm -hmm. these plans show 
more than that, they allow a 31 foot backyard. Yeah, they do. Meaning that if this corner property was built back all the way until that 25 foot mark, it would still block everyone's view on that block, but they could do that by right. But they wouldn't make, they wouldn't be able to because of the other variances that are included in an R6 in that district. You would have to meet the width requirements. Sure. Yeah. 20 plus 15 now, uh, I, that's not going to be hard to do. You would have a very long, very skinny building. You would have building. a five foot wide building, which would not be. I allowed. don't even know if it would be that wide, but, but yes. That's my point is that even if this was, say, single family, so say she was building a single family home that went back as far as she could do by right, uh -huh. it would still block everyone's view. It would, but it wouldn't work on that lot because it couldn't meet the other width variances. It, it, it doesn't so what fit. Be built on that lot. Maybe nothing, sir. That's how it's been for 200 years. That's a very difficult proposition. It's not in the law. I mean, I know there have been discussions about this, and I went through, and I had a very good pertinent. Let me just say, I worked with planning a little bit to m scour the code to make sure I wasn't missing some, something. And it, it's not there. There is no right in this code for a, a legal, non-conforming lot to be able to, to be able to be developed. Period. The end. Now, in this, uh, maybe in federal law or state law or somewhere, but not in local law does it say that. All it says is that the board and would have has the right to uh, approve a single family house um, in such a situation by basically by disregarding the square footage deficit. But that's I mean. But you couldn't do what you're suggesting and have a house except for very thin people that work, walk sideways. <laughs> Madam Councilwoman, you mentioned earlier in your testimony that it was suggested that the applicant do a single unit as a Well, that was a suggestion right. at, the, at the meeting. How would she do that? How Darn if I know how she could do anything on that lot. I'm not trying to be, honestly, I thought too much about this this week. Well, to I'm, the ask, I'm asking because you raised this issue. Yeah. If it's a reasonable and a good faith suggestion to build a once a single unit as opposed to a double unit, is it the intention, is it the understanding that she could even do that? Because I don't know if she could, but, and we what didn't. What does it make is my question. Well, it was something that was called out at a meeting of 20 people okay. in a living room. So I, I don't know who said it, or maybe a couple people said it, but we never really picked up on it. But, okay. but just the idea of the lack of compromise, the lack of consideration of maybe we could do this or that. And frankly, I, I don't know how you're going to do anything on that lot except let it be God's green earth. because of the shape of it and the location of it and it, it, it's a non-conforming lot. But then who would be responsible for maintaining that lot? We, uh, the neighborhood will be glad to testify uh, after what they heard that they've been maintaining it until it was purchased. Well, we don't have to, you have your turn and you can say that, but that's who, who's been maintaining it. And then 10 years from now when neighbors, some of which have moved on. Ten years from been. now, everything. I, I just, uh, it just well, strikes I, me. I, I think we're getting very speculative. <laughs> that's, let's, let's continue that's a reach. On. That gets philosophical. Yeah, let's continue on with the testimony. Just to, just to answer Mr. Field's uh, question, that someone brought it up at the time um, to Ms. Wilson uh, when we were sitting in a meeting that if um, you, you are willing to put a structure which is similar to each each house over there like if she going back then she don't need to go actually go 20 feet back further from my house and three stokes story high on the side nose with no set setba side setbacks 
and someone suggested that why not put a single story house there instead of putting this humongous structure with two that you need garages you need everything else that's why she has to go back so far and she has to make a so high and north side 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 setbacks that people will be looking into my house privacy well that, let me let me ask you the same question i asked mr proto if we were here today on an application for a single family home would you oppose it not sure this time what kind of structure she's willing to put in with the with the setbacks if it if the if the baltimore city allows a what the front of the lot is narrow or the back of back of the lot is how big is it if baltimore city allows a is it's, it's the same way familiar same size with the almost the same way with the other houses and have all the neighborhood and everybody is okay and baltimore city is okay then i will be okay as well that, that that's what it is i'm saying with the side set by so like there's a three-story structure or two-story structures right next to me within five feet there's no other house like this the, all the houses are the same way increasing the value i don't know what value she miss wilson is talking about where does increase the value when people are looking into other people's privacy okay and they're going this high and this miss wilson also said one thing there's a there are people this, uh, the side uh, the, the lot goes in all the way in the backs and people have built on it two stories or something maybe the garages or something far away on a false hill drive or false cliff drive in the way on the left side maybe f six eight houses down not right in that right in that corner where there is a there is a roland avenue and the false cliff and harding place have someone driven from Harding Place in that area? That area is all the, all, already a crazy as it. I myself cannot turn. It's hard to turn from Harding Place to Elm Avenue with the open lot that I can see what is going on. When there's a humongous structure there, who's going to make a turn over there? How hard is it? Okay. okay. Is, this the, is this the home for which you have a contract? Yes, on the corner, 3318, yes. How I, I mean, can it come closer? I thought for me. Yes, this is the one. Yes. How many levels is that home? Two stories. What is this up here on the top? Attic. And it, does that have a window? I I'm not sure this time because I bought it from the bank and we're going on a settlement. On have private. you seen it? I seen it. I was inside, but I did not notice all the way. I didn't go all the way. It looks House to me like bad, bad shape. Uh -huh. It looks to me like there's a window on the top level that you indicate attic space. Uh -huh. You've been in the property. I've been briefly inside for 10 minutes or so. How long have you been in it? You've been on the top level? Um, I don't think so, no. I was with my, uh, with my someone, a neighbor called and they said that since I bought it from the foreclosure, the neighbor called the next door and said, someone is in your, uh, uh, someone moved out so we better come and secure the property. So I went with my contractor, he went in there, uh, the person who opened the door, he opened the door and I put a lock box there and I put a lock there. So we secured the house. Okay, let me ask you this. The house next door looks like there's attic space there as well and this is the property that you have a contract on right my house is on the corner i understand one. that yes next to that house uh -huh. seems to be a similar one with uh maybe attic space but it looks like there's a window at the top there as well okay uh-huh i mean are those right. levels utilized to your knowledge for living I, I'm, I'm not sure that. i'm not sure the what is it, what is your intent with regard to this particular property that you have a contract on i will fix it up to what i will rent it are you going to have two levels? Are you going to have three levels? Uh, what are you going to do with the third level? Family home. There's no two levels or three levels. Home. I mean, what is the level about? Two stories. Well, you, you've just mentioned there's going to be a three levels home next door to you. Uh -huh. I'm asking you how many levels are in the home that you're going to own, and what you intend to do with it. I would fix it up and rent it or live in it. Is it going to be a finished third level? I don't know if there's a third level there or not at this point. Okay. So, I, so you're so, not understand so my question, Mr. Have a Chairman. Picture, Mr. Field. If you look on the side where the air condition is and the steps are, I have to move those as well. I'm not asking about that. I, I heard know, that. I have to move it, and then within five feet, right on the property line, with the property line, Ms. Wilson is trying to build a structure all the way up, right next to, with the, not even, and no setback. You need to use the microphone. Okay, yeah, you need to use the microphone. I think, thank you very much. Thank you. We have, a, we, we have. Well, hold on a second. Oops. Ms. Oh, did you get? Okay. Okay. Uh, did you get the? Thank you. I thought you were finished. Okay. I just want to make sure. I okay. Am. Okay. Okay. All right. Next. I, I'm just trying. Uh, to my name is Clifton Johnson. I live at 3316. Uh, I just want to talk about the traffic. Falls Cliff is a designated truck route. The larger trucks 
have to do uh, multiple turns, which stops traffic and also causes accidents. Uh, I do have a map. I only brought four of them. Wasn't sure how many people were going to be here. Uh, but as you can see, Falls Cliff, to try and make that U-turn, like I said, 18-wheelers, dump trucks, uh, even my Chevy Silverado, I had to do a multiple turn, three-point turn. Uh, the with the addition of the Fox Building, 92 apartments, the Critton additions, which is 19 townhouses, and I'm not sure how many apartments, uh, there's more and more traffic coming up and down there. So it is a very, very busy little uh, intersection, as she uh, stated before. And uh, just so you have it on the record, um, I cut the grass before those stakes went into the ground. Um, do you want us to make this part of the record? Uh, yes. Okay. And let me ask you the question. I'll follow up um, with my co-board member. You, your one house, you're next to the gentleman who was just testifying. Yes. Is your house a three-story home? It is a three-story. Is there a finished third? Is it a full height third floor? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kate McCulloch, and I also live on the block. Um, I know we've heard a lot about the green space. Um, but I'm here today to talk a little bit about the environmental concerns that we have as a neighborhood um, regarding this space. Um, so essentially, beyond the views and the place for the kids to play, which we know is, you know, it is what it is, um, there's just been a lot of, you know, in Baltimore, a lot of publications and information about climate change and how it's affecting, you know, our city. Um, the, basically, the increase in impervious surfaces and development um, essentially is leading to overwhelmed infrastructure and flooding. Um, I know, CJ, can you bring that photo? Um, sorry. So this property here on the corner, there are two storm drains here. Um, I don't know if that, if you guys can see or if whatever, but there's two storm drains there. Um, and essentially our concern is that there is already a lack of green space in the Hamden community. There's been a lot of development. Um, and we are located close to the Jones Falls. There's been a lot of sewage overflows related to lack of impervious space. So the fact that Ms. Wilson intends to cover 100% of the grass with a structure, um, you know, it, we don't want the sewage runoff tainting Baltimore. Um, I know that in the subtitle three of the zoning code, it talked that variances cannot be injurious to um, the community and cannot be detrimental to or endanger public health or safety. Um, and I feel that this property would increase the already overwhelmed storm drains um, in our community, leading to the structured overflows, one of which is located in the Fallsway, fairly close to where we are, to be overburdened. Um, Baltimore Magazine recently just published an article in relation to this. Um, I guess just to follow up, I mean, you know, one of my neighbors here said that there, there are already so many apartments, condos, homes for sale. There's been so much development. And I understand, you know, people have the need to make an income. However, there's not going to be any more green space. Once it's gone, then it's gone. Um, so, you know, a place for our kids to play, a place for us to look out when we have our morning coffee, you know, that does mean something to our community. and. We hope that you'll take that into consideration. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else from the opposition? Well, we kept it. Uh, there are, we can't. I'd like to ask a question. Okay. We're, we're not here to answer questions. Uh, it, it's in relation to the question you posed to us about whether or not we would accept. He's got to use this. You're going to. I'm sorry. I. Okay, hold on. Hold on a second. Let's, let's get your state your name for the record. My name is Alicia Cambroni. Do you need me to spell that? Okay. Thank you for uh, humoring me here. Y'all had asked. Let everyone have their, their ability to, to voice their opinion. Thank you. Um, Y'all had asked if we as a community would be more supportive of the, of the idea of uh, Ms. Wilson building a single family dwelling unit. And I think that everyone's concern was about the size of the proposed two family dwelling unit being as large as it is to a to accommodate that, to accommodate the parking for the extra units, for the extra people. So my question is, would, would anything smaller 
be possible? Like, is this well, this is exactly why. When before we started, we suggested that the parties talk uh, because sometimes. Excuse me, I'm I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes the parties can work through these issues, uh, but we're, we're now at the point where we've had a hearing and, and this board's now going to make a decision. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I think we have a consensus in the community. We can't figure out how anybody could build a house on that piece of land, which is, has a special definition because of its, its being on the map, but not being a practical place. We, we understand. We Thank understand you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, you want to address uh, whatever comments you want to address and then and, and finish up? Um, it, one thing that came up several times is that it takes up 100% of the green area, the grass. That's not true. I've already explained that why it's not true. Um, there is a large green space across the street. It's unkempt. Not one person in the neighborhood has ever thought of fixing it, changing it, replanting it. It's a mess. I'm going to call Gary Letteron with Three Baltimore and have him look at it, see what he can do. It's a large area. It covers the whole, almost the whole block between um, the post office and the Fox building. It separates um, Falls Cliff from the houses behind it that are on Hickory. It's, it's beautiful and it could be improved. So I, I think if people really care about green space, they should look into stuff, look at it, see what can I do, get permission, replant it. We have Roosevelt Park, we have Drood Hill Park, we have um, Hopkins, what's it called? A lot of parks. There's a, pardon me? University. N no, there's a large Winehurst. park, Winehurst. There's Winehurst. Wy Wyman Park, I, I, yes. Me people in the audience, please. I'm sorry. Wyman Park, Drood Hill Park, Roosevelt Park. Hamden is one of the best served little areas for parks in the entire city. Other than Patterson Park, it's amazing. So I think there's plenty of green space. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you all very much. All right, uh, next case, 2019-95, 1327 to 1341 Bayard Street. Sorry about that. Good, Good evening. Good evening. It's getting close. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> I raise your right hands, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Right, Mr. Yes. White, Jonathan White. I'm Jonathan White, yes. Okay. And your name, ma'am? Roxanne Humphrey. Okay. Mr. White. With a U. And I'll address uh, who will be. Uh, I, I will do the communicating on okay. behalf of Mr. White. I'm a contractor. Okay. Yes. So we have this to use portion of premises for retail space and. Uh, we had it for originally cafe with outdoor dining. I understand the outdoor dining has been uh, deleted. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And staff I'm reports. In. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Planning department reviewed this application and has also met with the applicants concerning this proposal, uh, and indicated that uh, it would be a good idea not to seek the outdoor dining under the circumstances and is supportive, Sorry, of, supportive of the amendment of this application to delete the outdoor dining. Thank you. Um, the property is located in the Carroll Camden Urban Renewal Plan area, and this proposed use would be compatible with that particular urban renewal plan, particularly given the fact that it is only going to take a small portion of the lot and the building uh, currently on that lot, which would remain in use as a commercial industrial use. The requirements uh, of that plan also include review of the exterior changes to the building and to the property itself. The plan provided by the applicants indicated there would be some landscaping done in front of this building. For that reason, the department is recommending approval of this application subject to the condition that all exterior alterations and improvements of this property, including related landscaping, are completed in accordance with plans approved by the planning department. Thank you. Okay, and Mr. White, since you're the applicant here, um, yes. if those, if, if this board were to approve your appeal, are those conditions acceptable to you? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Very good. All right, so let's hear about the project. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the opportunity. And I want to thank not only the planning department, but also the zoning committee that has worked so diligently with us in helping us with the plans. Uh, we have been fortunate enough to work with the Small Business Resource Center, as well as the uh, Baltimore Community Development, and they are all in support of what this will add to the Camden uh, Business Industrial Association. Uh, Noah Burke also is in support, and we've uh, just only by timing of all of the circumstances in Maryland, the death of our, our dear speaker, both the Senator, excuse me, <laughs> Senator Hayes and Delegate Mosby. I was in Annapolis, and they are in strong support of this adding to their area. Um, I just left upstairs with um, Councilman um, Reisinger, and he is going to meet with both Jonathan and myself, as well as some of the others. But basically, this is a actual, not only uh, retail and small bistro, but a work development project, as it is set up to be an incubator design. So the retail space, unlike um, what Jonathan currently owns and has a business in the 21230 Southern District, um, will be set up with a different brand of retail sportswear where people who cannot afford brick and mortar themselves will like while other incubators and artists and other businesses have around the city would be able to rent at a low cost a space where they could sell their retail. Um, of course, they would need to meet all of the requirements of the state and city um, tax codes and things in order to qualify for the agreement. But it is going to serve as a way to build entrepreneurship in the southern area. Um, I also had um, the pleasure of meeting with Officer Perry, uh, who is the community liaison for the Southern District, and he's in support of bringing this type of business to what has now been a traditional industrial area. Um, if you look at the plans that were presented, this particular building property is directly behind the MTA holding space for the drivers. It's the building. And so what they sought out with Jonathan and actually what motivated him to come up with the idea for the expansion of his business was an option for healthy eating, which is what the design of this bistro will be. Um, it is not a, a full service kitchen, but in fact, it will still need to meet the health department codes and so even after this board makes its recommendation there will be an array of different types of permits that will have to be acquired including with the health department uh, to meet the menu needs um, but we have indeed done a community assessment again recently joining the community association for the industrial business and knowing what the urban uh, renewal plan and what uh, some of the options are and the growth of that area this particular District 30 business clearly fits within that plan. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the no. board? No. Sure. No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next case, 2019 where am I here? 2019 100, 4300 East Lombard Street. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. We'll get you sworn in in a second. I raise your right hands, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Could you state your name for the record, please? Uh, my name is Claudio Peralta Romero. Uh, Mr. Romero, we have this to use as two dwelling units. Is that correct? Yes, correct, yeah. Okay. And staff reports? Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is zoned I-2, which is an industrial use that does not allow residential use. Therefore, the current use of the property as a single-family dwelling is actually a non-conforming use. This application requests approval to change one non-conforming use to another non-conforming use, which is a multifamily dwelling. And the department therefore recommends disapproval of the application because the zoning code does not authorize the board to approve a change of non-conforming use uh, from a row house or single-family dwelling to a multifamily dwelling in this district. Thank okay. you. Mr. Romero, did uh, do you understand what uh, what Mr. French was saying? Um, a little. <coughs> yes. Okay. Um, what in what what are you using the building for today? Um, now is is uh is finished, ready fixed. So I try to do the two building for the rent. 
Oh, well, what what is is a, is the building vacant today? Um, yes. It's vacant today. How long has it been vacant? Uh, uh, seven months. Okay, and what was in there before it was vacant? Oh, no. Nothing. Oh, okay, it's been vacant for. Yeah. Okay, how long have you owned the building? Uh, like ten months. Okay. Okay. I need to get her name. Your name. Uh, Himana Peralta Cruz. Hermana. I M E N A. Okay. Well, uh, again, we're we're faced with um, the situation here where. Uh, because of the zoning, uh, you're not even supposed to have one dwelling unit, uh, in, in, and we're talking about two dwelling units here. This is this is zoned industrial, mm -hmm. so if whatever uses are permitted in the I-2 zoning district would be permitted for for your building, um, but residential is just not permitted uh, it, for your building. Okay. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now we can do anything, right? We can do anything for that. Make it to do anything. Well, we, I, we can't advise you what or what not to do. What, we, what you should do is check uh, the zoning code, and I'm sure you, Mr. Baumgartner, uh, not today, uh, you know, sometime, uh, the next day or whenever you want to talk to him, we'll be able to help you with what you could do in the building. Okay. So um, but now can you take the um, permits occupies for one duly, right? Pardon? Uh, the, 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 so he can do an occupation use for a one single unit dwelling? No, it's, it, it, even a single dwelling unit is not permitted in this zoning area. It, unless it was previously existing, and that's why I was asking what was in the building because you you don't have a previous you don't have a use that's been in there for a long time. Uh, so what can he do now? Well, that's what I suggest. You can you that he contact Mr. Bumgardner tomorrow or the next day. Oh, and tomorrow. you can oh. talk through a little bit what's allowable for this zoning district. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next case: 2019-101, 918 Allendale Street. Afternoon. Afternoon. Hi. I raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Would you state your name for the record, please? Sunita Minor. And Mr. My M Ms. Minor, uh, this is to use premises as a 19-child daycare center. Yes. Great. Thank you. And staff reports. Yes. Planning department reviewed this application. Uh, although the department is very supportive of child care and development of additional child care centers in the city. The department notes that this particular location is one that it's very difficult to use for that purpose. This has to do specifically with the one-way streets and the narrowness of the streets uh, around this property. More specifically, there's not a suitable location for drop-off or pickup of children on this site. Uh, and in order to do it, it would require a drop-off uh, and pickup area be designated along uh, Allendale Street, which as we said is one way. And unfortunately, because of its one way orientation, the left hand side of a motor vehicle approaching this property would be the side that would have to be used for uh, taking someone in or out of the vehicle. And generally, the department has supported these passenger loading zones being established where it is the right hand side or the passenger side of the vehicle that would be used uh, for letting somebody out or picking somebody up. For that reason, uh, the department is recommending that approval of the application be for a reduced capacity of eight children and further recommends that the applicant discuss with both neighboring property owners and the parking authority of Baltimore City the possibility of establishing a passenger loading zone to serve this proposed child care center. Thank you. And, and Mr. French, just to be clear, um, a drop off and pick up is something that the planning department would, would think is advisable, but it's not required uh, if this board were to find otherwise. Is that correct? That is correct. It's not within the purview of the zoning code. It's a matter that is an operational issue. Okay. All right, Ms. Ms. Minor, uh, why don't you uh, 
tell us a little bit about what you want to do here and if you would address uh, the concerns raised by the planning department okay so um, my goal is to have a high quality um, learning center in the Edmiston Village area uh, for at least at least 19 students um, currently I would be accepting infants through five-year-olds um, however once approval of um, an official daycare and an accredited kindergarten it would be it would be a preschool for two to five year olds um, in regards to the loading I was w actually wondering if um, the back would be an option because the gate goes right out and we keep that area clean back there so would that be an option to come in for loading uh. And in addition to that, if my, and I'm, I'm almost, I'm very confident that my neighbors would be in agreement. I've been a resident there for the past 15 years, but um, the Flowerton Street option, although it still would be on the left, would that be um, something viable to get, to discuss for a loading zone? We, we can't advise you um, on where a, a loading zone mm -hmm. uh, should be located. Um, if you would like, I mean, we could postpone this case and you could talk to the planning department a little more and we can try to get you back in two weeks. Okay. Uh, now, that's up to you. All right. So with, with that being said, I was wondering, I, I was told that the plan, the parking authority may not discuss that unless I had approval from zoning already. Uh, Mr. Bumgarner, do you have any? That's probably very likely. Is it? Okay. Um, we okay. could certainly make a phone call <laughs> um, to discuss that particular issue. I would note that the rear alleyway is 16 feet 6 inches wide, mm -hmm. so it is wide enough for uh, vehicle travel. Uh, there's a bisecting alley that is 20 feet wide and another parallel alley that's also 16 feet 6 inches wide. Um, we could certainly reach out to the parking authority to get some direction on that. Uh, um, if not, we, c we, can, w we can make the decision today. It's up to you. I mean, it, you know. Um, <laughs> that's all for me. I mean, uh, I would love to go the parking authority route so that something is designated. Um, but I would also like your decision. Okay. <laughs> we, 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 okay, we, we can rule on it today. That's not a problem. So any questions from the board? I, I just have one. You said at least 19 kids. So yes. how many kids are you looking to? 19 would be the capacity. Um, so just up to 19. If it doesn't oh, get to 19, then it's just, you know, it'll be 15 or 16 or whatever, okay. but nothing more than 19. Okay. Okay. Any other board questions? And do you have um, a background um, in our child care, ma'am? Actually, I do. I've been an educator for the past 18 years. Um, I'm currently still teaching in Prince George's County. I'm looking to um, kind of come out next year, so I'm trying to make this smooth transition. And actually, this learning center is just a, a, a small scope of what I'm planning to do as far as education is concerned. I've actually been working with um, the a Charter School Alliance, where I'm going into um, opening up a charter school, uh, hopefully in the same area. So. Um, and once the learning center is actually established, I've been kind of working with some partners at um, Harp Bank uh, so that I can get funding for franchising because I believe what I have to offer um, in the city is the same high quality like Goddard and, you know, Celebri and things like that at a lower cost. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next case, 2019-102, 1624 El Reno Street. I do. Uh, are you the appellant? Yeah, John Bolster. Okay, Mr. Bolster, we have this to construct new two-story single-family detached dwelling. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. And do we have any staff reports? Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Okay. Tell us about your project. Okay, I'm I'm here uh, representing 
my friend Luis Condo. Uh, he's also my employee, and I'm mostly here for the sake of communication as his understanding of, of some of the issues is why we're here in the first okay. place. So Luis has lived in that house for about 12 years, I think, and bought it in 2013. And he and his daughter bought the house next door at 1628, I think in 2016, renovated that property. His daughter lives there with her family. And Luis got to a point where his house was pretty deteriorated. Um, he found some structural issues, so he wanted to renovate his property. And he got a demolition permit to get the process rolling. Huh. But I think when he started doing the interior demo, the structural damage, whether it was termite or, or what, was so extensive that he got ambitious and all of a sudden started taking the whole house down. Um, after the fact, he, he brought it to my attention and I explained to him that he would need to get a raising permit for that and I was trying to help him get that. And he also said the foundation was deteriorated so he took that out also. Now what he wants to do is just rebuild the same footprint, same two-story house. And the only reason we're here is because the existing house was on, uh, it's two feet four inches from the property line and the new zoning is a 10 foot side setback. Um, well, there's a couple of variances. I understand there's an interior side yard, there's a minimum front yard, and then there's the imper impervious surface. Okay, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of the minimum front yard. Um, he was issued to stop work orders and was fined by the city, so those fines have been paid or in, or in process in, as part of the raising permit to get paid. So the, the building that he's going to uh, replace, is, and you said the footprint's the same, is, is it on the exact same footprint in, on the lot? Yep. Okay. okay. Anything else? All right. Sir, you're in opposition? Yes, sir. So... Bruce Ebert, I live at 1607 Arena Street. I've lived on that detached house in that block for 37 and a half years. And there's been a number of problems with building codes, zoning. It's not just his property. I have to focus on that property. Because the number of properties, and there's a whole block, there are a number of properties that unfortunately that some of the neighborhood has declined. There have been deaths. There has been um, tax lien sales. There has been people because of health problems moved out, and some houses were in decline. And a lot of people came in and bought houses cheap, and didn't want to go with any type of permit. Uh, a lot of a lot of problems. I, I wish I had two hours. So this has been going on. I've complained about this for years. I went to see Cohen, the council member. He did nothing about it. I went over and over to. to the uh, 311 numbers, I've called everybody I could. I even went to Maryland delegates. I even went to State Center. These are other properties. It's like a little syndicate. So first of all, I see them working on a house. If somebody wants to change the door, whatever it was, or, or something small, that's fine. The house next door to the owner, 1628, when he built that, put up temporary wood fencing to block what was going on, what he was doing with that house. And he burned some of the debris in the backyard, eight foot high. I called the fire department. This has been going on. He didn't. So that was 1628 that he owns. 1624, there was, you were supposed to go through a procedure. There's supposed to be a public notification in public on the property. There was no request for a zoning hearing for a demolition permit. And oh, wait, wait, let me back up. Okay. You said there was no notice of a zoning hearing? None. Several months ago. And... Oh, wait, wait. Uh, Mr. Baumgartner, when was this? Uh, the posting notice was issued by our office on March 28th. Uh, the post by date would have been April 2nd of this year. We have a returned affidavit saying that the property was posted on April 2nd. 
uh, and that is signed um, at the bottom of the form. Okay. So, so let me correct that. There was that. I saw that. Okay. That's why I'm here. Okay. There was not any notice. There was no sign, nothing, no notification of a demolition process. They tore the whole house down. I let uh, uh, this gentleman know, the person working on it, there was a problem. I told them over and over again. I've called code enforcement. And one of the contractors, I got the name, the number, the telephone number, and let them know. So this was a contractor, not somebody doing on a society, that after the cease and desist order was going on, they were working on it. They were working on it at night. They were working in the dark. They were working on holidays. And you know why? Because they're slick enough to understand the inspectors aren't out after 4.30. And this went on and on and on. And he, and I brought it to his attention. I brought it to Baltimore City. I brought it to the Code Enforcement. I brought it to the of housing. I, I brought it to a, the attention of a state senator. I brought it to the attention of uh, a delegate. I, I brought it to the attention of Zeke Cohen. I brought it to the attention of the mayor. I brought it to touch all these people, and nothing was done. I, I, you know, there's probably a lot of good people working in housing and code enforcement. There's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of nonsense. It's unbelievable. You would not believe the stuff that I've been putting up with. Well, let, let's circle back to okay. uh, let's circle back to the reason that we're here today, and the reason we're here today is, yes, is owning. I apologize for running on. That's okay. That's okay. You know, and I understand. But there's there's three variances requested here today, and that's that's what we're here today to make a decision on. There is a impervious surface variance. There's a minimum front yard variance and a, and a minimum interior side yard variance requested. So that's why we're here today. I, I understand. So, so if you would like to address those, that's, that's, that's what we would like to hear from you. Well, to a certain extent, I, I, I haven't checked in all the details of all that information, I agree. But perhaps they won't s see it this way. But here is a person that completely took, uh, him, the contractor, people who working, took no responsibilities for any type of guidance. I, I personally, I think was I'm going to get in trouble for this. Maybe it's a question of character that he didn't care about all the rules. About six or seven years ago, I, I had to do some work on my roof. I was required to do yeah, a permit. I, I don't, I don't uh, mean, all right, I, all right. I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, all right, so. Other that, that we, yes, sir. We have to sort of stay on. No, I, I know, yeah. I know. But you have to understand the frustration. So, the what I'm dealing with. You know, it's, it's just, and it's not just him. There's a whole block that was doing this. There's a lot of stuff going on there with all, because the, na the neighbor, there were some houses that changed hands, whatever it was, and they don't care. Sir, I have a question for you. Would you agree that the fact that you're here in a zoning hearing is evidence that they're trying to do it the right way now? That's a good question. So <laughs> I believe in the power of redemption. I believe we all make mistakes, but the, pa the fact is there was a pattern there that he didn't have any concern for any of the zoning rules and, of course, didn't necessarily get the debris. And then I understand in some cases when you move a certain amount of material and soil, there, there's also concern about that. And they put it on a vacant lot of one of these people that were involved in a lot of the problems. You're concerned that he may not follow the rules going forward? Is that what your opposition is? Yes, sir, most definitely. Okay. I think we understand that. Well, so. Uh, <coughs> you can't predict the future, right? You well, just know what the pattern has been, but you're concerned that it may not be lawful or things followed in the right way and under proper guidance because of a past pattern, right? You understand exactly that I couldn't have put it any better. So uh, anybody understands any basic premise of a human nature, we all live our life in patterns. Uh, you know, <coughs> if you've been screwing up for a long time, there's a good chance he could screw up. But then again, I think the reason why he wants to do it right, because he got caught. He doesn't have any choice. Well, well you know, whether, whatever reason, it, we're here today, he's, he's here. I, I, I know, he I know. To do it the right way. So, sir, if you don't have anything else, I'm going to ask Mr. Bolter if he has anything he'd like to finalize. Yeah, if, if I could rebut on Mr. Condo's behalf. Um, 
it was more of a naivete the way things pr progressed in the beginning if he was working on the weekends or in the evening it's because he works a full-time job I can attest to that because he works for me sometimes when you're working on your own house that's what's what's available um, I'm there are there were no other contractors he was working on his own house he's, he's a very skilled craftsman 1628 El Reno Street is fully permitted, inspected by the books. That is the process underway here. He just jumped the gun. And I have never been in the situation before needing to raise a building, so I, because I'm a contractor myself, wasn't familiar with the process to guide him until we employed the services of an engineer to straighten things out. Okay. Can question, when, excuse me, what we, do you, you have a question of him? Yeah. So I would assume if you're in a contracting business and you're licensed, you would completely understand all the terms of what permits are. I'm not in the business, but understand the basic premises of that are. Ignorance is, you know what they say? Ignorance is no account for not following the law. If you involved in that, you should know. We understand, we understand uh, your concerns, and, and we do. We really do understand your concerns. It wasn't done right to begin with. We, we get that. Uh, you know, we're, he's here today doing this part of it the right way. Well, um, uh, do you have anything else? Uh, just one last thing. Um, that location is not the most desirable location for somebody to be in, in heavily investing in a property. It abuts on the rear to a Royal Farms on uh, um, Browning Highway right there. There's an apartment building across the street. This is the future of Baltimore, who, you know, these neighborhoods that might be empty, you know, they've improved the one next door, they're improving this one, and they're, they're making the commitment to stay and live in the city. Okay. And he just wants to rebuild the house so it doesn't fall down. Well, I, I just want to say, I, I don't want to make a commitment to live in the city anymore because it's gotten ridiculous, but anyway. Any questions from the board? No. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, next, 2019-106, uh, 1501 North Chester Street. Sworn in as soon as we're ready. Yeah, raise your right hands, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony? Raise your right hands, please. Okay, that's fine. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Do affirm. Okay. State your name for the record, please. Okay. I'm Bob Rosenfeld, Colbert Matz Rosenfeld. So Mr. Mr. Rosenfeld, we have this to construct new five story mixed use building with parking garage, correct? That is correct. Great. That's we have correct. staff reports. We do. We have a letter of support from the New Broadway East Community Association, signed by Doris Minor Terrell as board president. And then there's also a letter from an adjoining neighbor of approval, Mr. Stephen Brown. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is contained within the Broadway East Urban Renewal Plan area. And that particular urban renewal plan does impose design guidelines on new non-residential construction. The applicant is encouraged to develop the site plan and the architectural design for this particular proposed redevelopment in accordance with the guidelines contained in that plan. The department also notes that because this is going to be a large facility, it will require approval by the Urban Design and Architecture Advisory Panel. The Department of Planning recommends that approval of this application be subject to the condition that all development, construction, landscaping, and improvement of this property be completed in accordance with plans approved by the Department of Planning. Thank you. And Mr. Rosenfeld, if this board were to approve your appeal, are those conditions acceptable? Yes, they are. All right, all right. so tell us about your project. Okay. So uh, first for introduction, Carla Ryan is here with me. We can co-testify. We also have uh, Pastor Dante Hickman, who is uh, the, the pastor of 
of the Southern Baptist Church as well as the um, head of the Mary Harvin Transformation Center Community Development Corporation and also Josh Neiman who's like the developer's rep is a good way to describe. So we can go through our what we have here and you know, maybe if, the, if, if you th have questions then we can go from there. Okay, so the, uh, it's, like you said, it's a application to construct a five-story mixed-use building uh, with structured parking. Uh, we, re we are requesting variances for parking, uh, rear yard, interior side, and building height. Uh, the site is zoned IMU. It's surrounded by R8, and our site area is about 32,000 square feet, roughly a little bit over three-quarters of an acre. We're at the northeast corner of the intersection of North Chester and East Oliver Street. Uh, it's an existing vacant lot. It's been vacant. The building that was on it, it was demolished in July of 2018. It had been vacant for over 30 years. It was an old dry cleaning plant uh, and it had just been sitting there for 30 years. Uh, surrounding uses are residential and open space. Um, as the, uh, it's part of the East Baltimore Revitalization Project, which was accepted by the Planning Commission on September 7, 27, 2018. It did go through uh, under, uh, under, it went through schematic phase UDAP in uh, July 26, 2018. You know, the, the team will have to go back to UDAP for design review. Uh, it's in the Broadway East Urban <coughs> Renewal Plan. So. Can I also just mention, we also do have SPRC approval right. from September of 2018. Um, so I just want to mention that. Okay. Thank you. What was your name? I didn't get your name. Carla Ryan, R-Y-O-N. So what we're proposing is a five-story mixed-use commercial building, first floor retail, uh, fourth floor health care clinic, fifth floor office, second and third floor will be structured parking. I think you all have the plans. Uh, on the third floor, there will be an open parking deck, uh, which is why we need our interior side yards variants. So we're we're at your we're pushing out the parking deck uh, on this uh, on the alley side to actually try to get more parking and lessen the parking variants that we need. Uh, the main pedestrian entrance is at the corner of Chester and Oliver Streets. There's also an additional retail entry a little further up the uh, up a little north on Chester Street. <coughs> The, uh, the access to the parking garage, we have a parking garage is on East Oliver Street and we've worked out all the grade differences and elevations for that. So the building, the variances we're requesting are building height of 80 feet in lieu of 60, permitted. Interior side of 6 feet in lieu of 10 feet. Uh, rear yard of 2 feet in lieu of 15. And parking, 124 spaces in lieu of 128 required. As was mentioned, there's a support letter from the New Broadway East Community Association and a support letter from the adjoining neighbor uh, behind us uh, on East Oliver. Um, variance justification, I'll go through it fairly quickly. The building height itself is 66 feet from the finished floor elevation to the top of the fifth floor, um, of which 28 feet is parking, garage, and ramp. Um, and we've measured that from mean uh, curb height the road slopes up Chester, so we were, were not fighting grade, but uh, we using that, we've added two feet to the building height. In addition, there's a 10-foot rooftop screening wall uh, for mechanical equipment, which is greater than 25% of the roof area. So when you add that all up, that's 78 feet. Uh, we, a two-foot buff buffer you know, gives us the 80 feet we're requesting. Um, also, the tenant spaces, some of the floor area and ceiling heights are user driven. So as we get into the design, you know, they're going to need higher uh, you know, ceiling heights, which, which make, make it a little higher. Uh, we do not believe that the height variances will have any impact, adverse impact <coughs> on neighboring properties. Uh, properties across the street from open space, the Broadway East Park. Um, north of the site are rear row houses separated by an alley. East of the site are an area of row houses separated by an alley. Uh, adjoining our adjoining neighbor to the east, which is 2124 East Oliver, uh, we've, we're setting our building back 10 feet adjacent to his house to allow for light and air to reach his second story window. Uh, there is a the slope up Oliver Street is slit steep, so we had to work with that. 
Um, and the exhibit you have is our, SIP, SP, our approved SPRC plan. Um, so we won't get into too much about, about the slope, but there is like 7% slope, and, you know, and the, the curb level is at 114. So, so you, when you're, if you're standing on Chester, the building height would appear seven feet less. And then um, also in the rear, there's um, 11 foot grade change from Chester where we're measuring the, the building height to the rear. So that's an 11 foot higher elevation in the rear. So if you were standing in the alley along the rear, the building height would again appear about 11 feet less than where we're actually measuring per the zoning code. Based on how the grades work. Okay. Mm -hmm. The interior side yard of uh, required for the, the third floor parking deck that pushes to our north. Uh, it's an open air deck that's not an enclosed building structure. Uh, the, the area below will be open and there will be a screening wall along Ch North Chester Street only. The screening will be set back 10 feet from the side property line, the interior. Uh, the enclosed building on the first, second, fourth, and fifth floors is actually set back 53 feet from the interior property line. So it's only this third floor parking deck that requires the variance. Uh, it, the projections allow for what it gets us is 10 additional parking spaces, which gets us much closer to the number the required of 128. The rear yard behind us on the other side of Chester, um, you know, we, we're, we are IMU. There's, we're in a, what you would call a C of R8. Uh, the requirement is 15 feet. Um, and it's required only where the rear property line abuts a residential district. So the rear setback requirement would be either none or zero if we did not if we did not abut the residential district. The overall length of our property line back there is 240 feet. Of that length, 160 feet of it does not abut the residential district because there's an alley that separates the two. Along this 160 feet, no rear setback is required. The 15-foot rear yard only applies to about an 80-foot portion. Of, of the rear property line that actually abuts the residential zone on the more on the southeastern part of the site. Um, of that 80 feet, uh, 40, 40 feet is set back the two feet along there and 40 feet is another 40 feet is set back 10. That's where we're asking for the rears. Uh, our, along our adjoining neighbor, the building we purposely set back our building 10 feet from the property line. So uh, most of this two foot request is, is along a, is along an alley, 12-foot alley. Um, again, also, I just wanted to also mention um, the adjoining neighbor on Chester Street, or I'm sorry, on Oliver Street, that is the letter of support that we have from the neighbor. Okay. Stephen Brown is his name. Uh, and again, the size of the tenant spaces, again, are user-driven, so we try to work within our users to get that to work. Um, the project is going to be partially publicly funded, about 25%. The max, max, this will maximize the impact of public funding by maximizing floor area of the uses serving the community, which is what we're doing. Parking variance. Uh, the development will draw pedestrian traffic, uh, so that you know, we do intend to serve the community. Uh, there are bus lines on Gay Street and Federal. Um, so our overall justification um, we are part of the East Baltimore Revitalization Project, and as I mentioned, the Mary Harvin Transformation Center Community Development Corporation, of which Pastor Hickman is the, uh, leads that organization. They're a local community stakeholder and have a successful track record with other developments in the area. It identifies the Gay Street, Char Chester Street corridors as infill opportunities uh, to focus investment in new development also identifies Chester Street as an opportunity for retail without displacing residents. Uh, the master plan calls for mixed use, commercial and retail developments, as well as housing, public safety, educational facilities, urban gardens and parks, streetscapes and green network infrastructure. And uh, high, it's basically high density infill that, that development that connects Eager Park to Clifton Park. Uh, the potential ten tenants for our project include a pharmacy, a smoothie shop, healthcare clinic, which is probably Johns Hopkins, and offices. Um, we're part of the Broadway East Urban Renewal Plan. So the design guidelines of the Urban Renewal Plan support the interior side variance and building height because, quote, to provide convenient, sufficient, and incon inconspicuous parking, 
to serve the new businesses. And also the new construction guidelines of the urban renewal plan support the requested rear variance. Buildings should completely enclose each block to enhance the urban character and all public and private spaces must be defined, avoiding empty spaces where, uh, where uses are unclear. So we don't want to create areas that it look like a, it's sometimes called a jack-o'-lantern where you have uh, cutouts you know, that, that between, between properties. This will bring jobs to the area, construction and full-time, resources, healthcare clinic, potential pharmacy. Commercial amenities will be pedestrian available, uh, as well as bringing vehicular uh, commercial activity. Finally, uh, the variances will not be detrimental to the use and enjoyment of the properties in the immediate vicinity or, sub or substantially diminish or impair property values in the neighborhood. Rather, the variances will promote pedestrian and commercial activity along North Chester Street and provide needed community resources. This new proposed building will also replace what was formerly, again, I mentioned, a vacant industrial building that sat vacant for over 30 years before being demoed last summer. <coughs> it was an eyesore and detri detrimental to public safety. The new proposed development on this site will bring in jobs and community resources along the prominent corridor through the community. So that's, hey, what, that's what I have to Thank say. you very much. That's plenty. <laughs> Do we have uh, any questions for the board? <laughs> no, sir. Yep. Did you want to provide any other testimony? No. Nope. All right. No, no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, come on up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's nice. That's a fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next case, 2019-108-101 to 105 West North Avenue. Mr. Rosenfeld, you might as well stay up here. No, well, yeah. not really. Eventually, but not now. Not now? Okay. Okay, let's get everybody sworn in. It's going to provide testimony. Raise your right hands, please. <laughs> Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. Right. Counsel, would you state your name for the record, please? Uh, Alyssa Domsel with Ballard Spar okay. on, be uh, on behalf of Infill Development. Domsel, we have this to construct new five story mixed use building. 52 dwelling units with tenant amenities and ground floor retail space. Is that correct? That's correct. Great. Thank you. Staff reports? Yes, we have uh, letters in of support in the file. One from Councilman Robert Stokes, who I might add was here earlier and would like to have testified in person but could not stay for the remainder of the docket. So we assured him that his letter would be part of the file. Uh, we also have a letter of support from the uh, Baltimore Development Corporation, signed by Kimberly Clark, Executive Vice President. And then there's also a letter of support by an individual, Andre Stone, at 305 East Lafayette Avenue. Um, but I, I want to read just one paragraph. It's a general letter of support, but this last paragraph is a little bit unique. It states, as for the bike parking variance, I believe the developers should fully comply with this mandate, additionally considering the fact that this building would be located across the street from the city's most heavily used bike thoroughfare, I would ask that the developers to I would ask the developers to make the bike parking a more prominent feature rather than just shoving it into a dark room in the basement as is currently proposed. Charles Moore. Excuse me. Yeah, there are, um, there are letters of support provided to the board from Charles North Community Association, Midtown Community Benefits District, uh, Baltimore Development Corporation, and Councilman Stokes' office. I have copies if needed. Do you? Uh, if we don't have them, we can take them from you. We can make them part of the record. Sure. Yep, there's all, there's all four of them. Planning Department has reviewed this application, noted that this property is in the Charles North Revitalization Area or Renewal Plan Area. And therefore, this proposed redevelopment of this property will undergo full review by the planning department. Uh, in addition, as a new structure, uh, particularly on a prominent street corner, it's going to have review also by the Urban Design and Architectural Advisory Panel. The department is recommending approval of the application be subject to the condition that all development, construction, 
landscaping and improvement of the property be completed in accordance with plans approved by the Department of Planning. Thank you. And Council, if this board were to approve this appeal, are those conditions acceptable to your client? Yes, they are. Okay, thank you. Tell us about your project. Um, all right, with me today is Ed Morris of Infill Development, uh, Josh Neiman, the developer, um, the project um, contractor, and the um, Charles Alexander, the project architect, if there are any questions. Um, Ed is here to uh, introduce the project. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You Thank can bend you. that up if yeah. you want. Thank you for all you do. Uh, having seen all of it, it's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it's been uh, called other things, but we'll take the impressive. Yeah, we'll take that. My uh, father-in-law and mother-in-law have owned the property since 1988. It's part of a group originally. And then 90, 1994, they bought it outright, and they were the sole owners. They operated their business out of the building until about 2012, 2013, and, si and since then it's been mostly vacant and has fallen into disrepair. Uh, my father-in-law last year, uh, March, asked me to help him out. I'm an attorney by training. I'm a real estate broker in Philadelphia, and I manage real estate for a community development corporation in Philadelphia. Uh, we made the property available uh, for lease, and we interviewed a bunch of people, and we quickly realized that the work the property needed didn't justify the rents. The rents wouldn't justify the work. Uh, and so then we began... Uh, researching what the highest and best use might be, and that's where we came up with the development plan as it is today, albeit, you know, uh, conditioned upon approval. Uh, our current plan is for 52 uh, residential units uh, with ground floor retail. Uh, the unit sizes uh, are one bedroom and studio units. Our hope is to capture the uh, young urban professional or graduate student uh, from either MICA or UB who might want to live there or in the area uh, in the district. Um, and so our proposed unit sizes are a range from 450 potentially to 550 that, you know, the, the design uh, is still underway. Uh, and we are proposing uh, no parking on the site. Uh, it was noted earlier uh, that we are in close proximity to the cycle track. We have uh, a surface lot immediately adjacent to us, which is owned by MICA, and there's a, a surface lot immediately adjacent to that, I'm sorry, to the right side of the, the Lazarus building. And there's also street parking uh, and garage parking uh, very close by. Uh, and I think that's my background in Wyoming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the property is located in a C2 zoning district. Uh, we are here to request variances for minimum lot area and parking. Um, in the C2 zoning district, the minimum lot area is 225 square feet per unit, with 52 units on a lot area of approximately 8146 square feet. Uh, the proposed building has a lot area of um, 156 square feet per unit. Um, so we are requesting to build 52 units, 36 units would be permitted by right. Um, as to parking, the um, requirement is one space per unit, um, so that would the, be 52 parking spaces, and the, uh, but the retail under 2,500 square feet is exempt in a C2 district. Um, so speaking to lot area, uh, this is an area, the Charles North, Station North area has seen rapid growth in recent years. Um, the Arts and Entertainment District has flourished. Uh, MICA has seen great expansion. This is directly next door to MICA's Lazarus building. Um, this is an area with a need for housing options and a diversity of housing options. Um, what we have seen is that there, the market demand in this area is for smaller market rate but more affordable units, as Mr. Morris said, um, in the range of 450, 550 square, feet, uh, square foot units for graduate students, young professionals in that area. Um, the variants that we're talking about today, we're only talking about lot area. We're only talking about density. We're not going for a height variance. We are building 60 feet um, at grade on the North Avenue frontage. Um, so from the exterior, we're talking about the same building we could build by right. We're only seeking a variance for the number of units that would go in that building. And that is really just meeting the market demand for the smaller units. It, by right, we could build 36 larger units, but that's not what the market is in this location. 
This is just a, a question purely of unit size. Um, as to parking, the, this property is very uh, oddly configured. It's very narrow. On the North Avenue frontage has only about 47 feet um, of frontage, and then it, um, along Maryland is about 175 feet of frontage. Typically, um, the, you need 60 feet of width to have a true parking circulation because you have 20 feet of um, the length of vehicles plus two driveway access, um, uh, two um, 20 foot base for driveway access. Um, the code, the code requires a parking space in Baltimore City to be um, typically nine by 20. Um, so you're in a position where there is not, you don't have the ability to put parking, surface parking as you would expect, sort of uh, lengthwise along the property. And, um, and even if you were to do that, it, the property would just not accommodate um, a, a large number of spaces. Um, Excuse the, me, Council. Did, did, did the developer look anywhere to try to obtain um, a long-term lease for parking? We have had preliminary conversations. Uh, I'm not comfortable saying that we've committed to anything, but there are options and we have had conversations regarding long-term leasing parking. What, what, how many spaces are we talking about? I, I, we haven't gotten that far. Okay. I would, I would just say that in, in the planning of this project, you know, we've looked a lot at who the expected tenant would be. And the expected tenant is somebody who is using the cycle track using the wealth of transit options, all of the bus routes on North, Howard, Maryland, um, two blocks from the light rail, very close to Penn Station. We, th we are just not expecting this to be the type of building where everyone has a car. And um, I think that's sort of been reflected in the letters of support that we received from the community association and from um, the benefits district, the councilman. Um, and BDC is just that this is the expected, uh, the expected tenant is not uh, a car owner. I mean, this is, uh, the, the area has changed rapidly and um, the demand is not necessarily for, um, for you know, one space per unit in that area. Um, so that the site constraints um, really do make it difficult to accommodate any amount of parking um, as discussed and at the same time develop any portion of the site. Um, it really, providing parking would really eat up a significant usable portion of the site. Um, so in conclusion, we have a uniquely situated lot. It's a narrow lot. It's a prominent corner. What the unifying message that we saw in, in working closely with the community and with other stakeholders is that people want density on this corner. They want activity. They want eyes on the street. They want safety. And this is a way for us, um, this project is, is an ideal way to take an underutilized lot and get the people um, to, uh, to retail in that area um, to you know, the various businesses that are there. Um, as to lot area, the market demand is for smaller units that would allow us to keep the rent down. Um, larger units, uh, to impose only the units that are permitted by right would mean larger units that are not, um, it, that would not be what the market demands in that area. Um, as to parking, um, as we mentioned, the surface parking lot would be nearly impossible on this site. Um, it would consume a large portion of the usable site and we would not be able to um, make meaningful use of the remainder. Um, I can uh, discuss the remaining of the standards in 5308 if the board has any questions. We, we I just have one yeah. question. Sure. Uh, you may have already said it, but the neighboring communities who have provided letters of support, mm -hmm. I'm assuming they're all aware that there's no parking provided in your project. Yes, that was actually on the, um, the sign okay. specifically. And, and a lot of the letters. Uh, and a lot of the letters refer to the fact that there are, is no parking. Yeah, there are, there are a number of surface parking lots, um, apart from the question of a long-term lease as to zoning, but as, as to just use, uh, there are a number of surface parking lots in the area, and I think that generally the perception is that these are either people who will not have cars or people who feel that their parking needs are already met. Okay. And we, we don't, I mean, we don't need the standards. If you want to put them on the record, feel free. It's up to you. No, that's all right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Any questions? No. I'm good. no. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one last case, 2019-104. I didn't click it over, I'm sorry. I realized we had another case. Yeah. Call it one more time for me. 2019-104. Uh, 
1008 Morton Street. Okay, let me get you sworn in. Uh, raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Great. Um, we had this case on our consent docket, uh, so this part of the hearing will be very brief. Um, state your name for the record, please. David Wiesand. And Mr. Wiesand, what's your relationship? W I E S A N D. And what's your relationship to the property? Uh, I'm the owner. Okay. We have the applicant as a Philip Scott. He is our architect that's okay. been working with us. Okay. And we have this to use second floor for coffee bean roasting. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Do we have any staff reports? Planning Department has no comment on, on this application. Notes that this property is in an historic district and therefore uh, would be subject to review by the Commission for Historic and Architectural Preservation staff for any exterior alterations that might be needed to the building. Thank okay. you. Um, zoning Board staff having reviewed your appeal, we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. You were on the consent docket, so okay. this is very quick. So All thank right, you beautiful. very much. All right, thank you very much for your hard work. Good luck. Thank you. And we are off the record. Oh, okay. Just run to the restroom before we dive into this.